Welcome and thank you for joining the Art of Production Design, a panel discussion with the Oscar nominees presented by the American Cinematheque, the Art Directors Guild and the Set Decorators Society of America, sponsored by Variety. This panel is with all the Oscar nominated production designers and the Oscar nominated set decorators for the Academy Award. It is moderated by Thomas Walsh and Jan Pascal. I'm Gwen de Glis, Deputy Director for the American Cinematheque. Please visit our website, americancinematheque.com, for information about our upcoming programs and how you can support the American Cinematheque by becoming a member and making a donation. Enjoy the discussion. Peter uh, and Kathy, Peter Francis and Kathy Featherstone, thank you so much for joining us for this annual uh, festival of celebration of cinematic visual arts. And uh, it's really a privilege for Jan in the lower box and myself to say welcome and uh, uh, good day to you. Um, Hello. Hello, and thank you for inviting us. It's a real oh, honor. Please, you know, you have to go okay. through the gauntlet to get here, but you've done yeah. it. So with that, I'm gonna stop making speeches for the rest of the day. That was it. This is our <laughs> opener uh, and it's live. So you get the good and the bad. Um, we always like to start with a simple question for both of you to answer. Uh, is to share a very brief memory of your personal journeys uh, that brought you into our profession. So, uh, Peter and then uh, Kathy. Um, well, I um, originally I was trained as a landscape architect, which was quite a different uh, different field, but similar. Um, <clears throat> and my final project was um, designing a new city space for one of the big cities in the UK. And I wanted to give it something a, a different edge. And, and I'd always been inspired by film anyway. And funnily enough, um, Flash Gordon was was always on my mind. And I wanted this entrance to this city to look like, you know, something out of Flash Gordon. So my my concept for the whole project became this sort of science fiction uh folly in the middle of this city and um i had there was a huge town hall and i had these characters the the, the wing men flying from the top of the <laughs> towers down into a, and splashing into a pool in the middle of this space and that was sort of my uh it, and, and i used to think god does somebody actually do this for a job you know I mean, how wouldn't it be fantastic <laughs> if actually somebody does uh who does this so uh i did a bit of you know, research as you do, and um, ended up finding a, a course actually uh, in film and TV design, which I went and did um, after my degree. And then I, um, I got, I, you know, the best way to learn this industry is to on the job. You know, we went to the, uh, this one year course, which was fantastic, and gave me so an, an, in, an inroad and an insight into how film industry works. And my first experience of walking onto an empty stage at Pinewood was just. The most amazing experience and the lights were out <laughs> and it was just yeah. just the feeling of the scale and uh and of course then i started as an art department uh, runner and as an assistant and worked my way up through the through the industry through all the different grades um and i still say to this day the best jobs in the art department are being an art department assistant and being a production designer the two bookends if you like to the to the whole uh to, to the to the to the from, from starting off to getting to be a production designer those art department assistant because you get to meet everybody you see the whole you see what happens in every department right. um you know and 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 the same when you get to be a production designer it's it's, it's the best job in the world isn't it so it's also yeah, as, as the production assistant you're forgiven for not knowing anything and as the yeah. designer you are you are con constantly abused for not knowing everything yeah, <laughs> it's, it's true. Both ends, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It's true. It's very true. You can sort of get away with it a bit more when you're not part of the system, maybe. But, <laughs> uh, but no, that's. Um, well, I I always had an interest in theatre when I was really young. I was always involved in school plays, and um, looking back, I realised that I was always doing the um, costume or set design. And that, that led me to do that at college. And I was in a Shakespeare society as well, which I did set in costume for. And, and then Kenneth Branagh's uh, Much To Do About Nothing came out. Yeah. And, and I remember um, it was such a beautiful landscape in Italy. And I, um, 
and the sets were great and lovely and it was all hot and everyone looked like they were having an amazing time. And, um, and I got the book about the film and I remember yeah. pouring over it and over the sets and, and a quote in it said, it was like we were having the best time and someone just turned the camera on. And I totally remember just thinking, I, lo I love storytelling, you know, I've done it for years in theatre, but this is I, next level. I can, you know, potentially go around the world and, you know, see amazing places. And that I think was a turning point for me. And then I went to university and did, um, and did the same there. And then, I, and I worked my way up through the industry. I kind of came in a, a weird way. I, I started in documentaries, doing drama documentaries, which is the lower end of the scale, but um, it was great actually, um, you know, doing lots of different periods. And then, um, and then I was an assistant on lots of big Hollywood films, working with some amazing set decorators. It was a really amazing training ground. Um, and, and, and now I'm, I'm here. So yeah. yeah, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it's been a, it's been a great journey, especially through doing TV and documentary and film. I feel like I've, I've got a good grounding. Mm -hmm. They are, they all contribute. All those experiences make us stronger and better. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Especially working with lower budgets. Yeah. I think <laughs> that always comes in. Well, that's the interesting thing. We have the whole gamut of, of budgets this on this panel uh, today. It's you know everything from very fiscally tight to, God, where did they get all this money? But yeah. you know, it uh -huh. doesn't necessarily mean it comes to the art department, but someone gets it. <laughs> that, that's for sure. Yeah, where does it go? <laughs> I don't know. That's, that's <laughs> <a good story. laughs> no. Okay. Yeah. Jan, did you want to pick up? Yeah. Well, I have to say that. I got the feeling watching the father that I was Anthony Hopkins because I was I was confused about what department I was in. And I just thought that you told that story so well. And I wondered how you, you know, it, it, whether you put Easter eggs in there that were uh, little clues or if you set up the geography. I don't know if I could, you know, draw the set the way that each of them were, the apartments were, it was, I had to keep scratching my head and say, where am I now? And I felt as confused as Anthony Hopkins did, his character. And I just thought you told that so well that it cut together and it it was, I, I don't know, I, I, I just have to tell us about how you achieved what you achieved because it was so brilliantly done. I mean, the, the, the first premise was that uh, we had we had to have Anthony's flat, Anne's flat, the doctor's surgery and the care home. So um, it was actually my first meeting with Florian was fantastic, actually, because I um, <clears throat> I'd done a plan. I'd sort of read the script. I went in with my mood boards, but I'd also tried to work out the geography of the space because the script sort of explains where that he's, that he's in his bedroom in the kitchen, you know, the specific rooms, of course. So I'd drawn this layout of this of this set, and I went in to see him, and I and I was sort of you know showing the pictures as you do, and I said, well, I've actually drawn a plan of the set. I don't know if you're interested. Oh, he said yes. He said, you show me yours, and I'll show you mine. I was like, okay. So I took my sketchbook out, and it was just a pencil drawing, you know. And I took my, my sketch, I opened the sketchbook. And he looks down at it, and there was a couple of producers there, and, they, and suddenly they're going, oh, oh, that's interesting. And Florian looked at me, took out a piece of paper, unfolded it, put it next to my plan, and we were, they were exactly the same. <gasps> Honestly, it, it, it's never happened to me before. It was just like, I was like, oh, wow, okay. So we were actually, wow. I think I had a bedroom in one corner and he had it in the other. That was the only difference. So from day one, we were sort of on the same page. And... Um, it was just well. It never happens usually, does it? That sort of thing. So, so the so, so the the point was that the, that the the architecture had to stay the same. So the layout was the same for both sets. I mean, listen, it was the one, same set revamped. Obviously, I mean, it wasn't. We didn't because I, I went in saying, oh, well, perhaps we build two side by side, and they're like, no, nah, we haven't got the money. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we built. So, so the so the layout of the set. And there's a long corridor which is the spine, 
And uh, in parallel to that is the living room, the study and the uh, dining room and the kitchens over the over the hall and the auntie's bedroom right at the end, which is really important to have it at the end of the corridor because there's lots of toing and froing down that, that long corridor. Um, so and doors were really important. And so what we did, uh, we had like the living room had three entrances and the study two and the kitchen two and the dining room two, so that you so that you could so that you could actually shoot in one direction. You didn't really know which way you were looking because all the doors, the doors were quite a graphic sort of statement, to be honest. Yeah, very much so. Because there was one thing that we, to sort of carry it through from one scenario to the next. So, um, and then interestingly, I speak to Kathy about this, but when we did the dressing, subconsciously, we um, sort of things did go in the same places, although it was all actually really planned, actually worked out because we had to have all these different scenarios where things kept disappearing. So um, it was very much, it was, it, was, it was all very carefully worked out. I gave, I also gave Florian and Ben um, dressing plans and layouts for the different scenarios so that they could plan all their shots. Like in Anthony's flat, we have the arrangement of furniture, in one direction and in Anne's we have it the other way around so so we did it it was actually the planning behind it all was pretty intense and we did actually um figure out exactly what was going to stay and what was going to go what would disappear down the, as the story progressed so I'd love to say it was all very sort of um spontaneous and we did but it was actually really organized and you know um and Florian as well of course is what was really nice, actually, is Florian has a... You'll ask him a question, he'll look you straight in the eye, and he'll give you an answer. And if he can't give you an answer there and then, he'll say, give me five minutes and I'll think about it, and he'll come back with an answer. So we were all... all the way, And our prep time was really short. I mean, I had... Um, from, from That's getting another the job, question. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Yeah, go on. <laughs> that was another oh, question I, that I had. Yeah. Listen, I do. I tend to waffle, so no, <laughs> no. I go off on, I go off on tangents. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away, Kathy. <laughs> um, yeah, we well, we did. We had a very short prep time. Uh, I think we had um, five weeks to build. Oh my god! So was it five no, well, we weeks? Built the, the, we built the set three in weeks, three weeks. Actually, to build. Yeah. yeah. So it was trying to work out how we were going to, um, you know, pre present Anthony's and Anne's flat in this confused state. And we would, uh, originally we were going to try to mirror Anthony's belongings in Anne's flat. So one from one period, one from another in Anne's. Because, mm -hmm. you know, Anthony has, he moved there in the 80s and so he's lived there for 40 years. So it, you know, it was very layered. But, um, and actually we, we talked about that with Florian and he wasn't, you know, he felt like we didn't need to do that. And actually watching the film, we didn't need to do that. There was enough in the architecture um, to present that confusion. So we didn't need to go so much into detail, but like Peter said, it did naturally come out in the way that we were dressing it as much as we planned it. There was, there's always an element that you don't want to plan with dressing, of course, because you just got to stand in the space and see how it feels, but, um, but, Yes, I've lost my track now, actually. But um... <laughs> you, you told us what we wanted to hear. Eric. Oh, good. Um, yeah. We're gonna, we're gonna, because of time, we're gonna have to move into our last question, um, which is really for both of you again, and it's really about advice and encouragement to others that might want to follow in your footsteps. What would you say to someone who wants to uh, take this up for a profession? Ladies first. Um, <laughs> I would say. Um, working on the job, absolutely. Cold calling people um, is in this day and age, don't send emails, call somebody, offer your services and try and get on set because I think that that's the most important thing. I know it's difficult in COVID times, but be persistent, never give up. There's actually, there's more work around now than there's ever been. So mm -hmm. if you, you know, if you want it, it's there. It really is there. Just, you just got to push through those awkward calls, I think, but um, that's why I'd say persistence. It's great. Yeah, I, I would say to each individual person, everybody has a different skill and everybody has a different talent to offer and something different to bring to the table. And I remember when I first started being amazed at how 
all these different people with different backgrounds and different skills come together to produce one thing, a film. And I always say it's amazing when you see a, an electrician and a, an art director having a conversation about something and, 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 and on the same page. And I think for anybody who's interested in getting into the industry, develop your own skills, your own talent. Don't try and be somebody else. Try and bring what you, the talent you've got to the table because every job demands a different skill and a different talent. So you might be particularly good at doing a certain type of calligraphy or you might be great at um, making, making architectural models or you might be great at um, making clothes for little dolls. I've, we have an assistant, we have this doll and she went home and made all the clothes for the doll herself. So all those skills that everyone's got, bring them with you and, and just keep, don't let anyone tell you that your skills aren't helpful because they are. You might not be the perfect, like the person sitting next to you maybe is doing the most amazing technical drawings, but they probably can't do what you're doing. So everybody has a skill and everybody needs to, needs, and we need more people doing practical stuff and doing vocational courses and doing training rather than, don't, don't try and make it an academic world because it isn't. Yeah. And, and draw with a pencil. I've got this thing about computer okay. drawings. It drives me mad. I, I can't read computer yes. drawings. They don't interest me. The lines are all the same. Um, if somebody comes to me with a portfolio of hand drawings or tech, or if they've tried to draw something te technical drawing by pencil, I love to see it. Um, shade your drawings, do whatever you want to give those drawings the character and the feel you want. Don't come and show that you can, you know how to operate a computer program because it doesn't, I'm afraid, <laughs> It really doesn't interest me. They are it's a useful <laughs> tool, of course, and yeah, everyone has to be able to do it, but it doesn't really do anything for me at all. Let you over. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's much into my heart. Yeah. Because, because we have to know but you, you have to know how to make it work when the power goes out. Absolutely. So, thank you guys. It's just a hey, delight welcome. to meet you. And and when we have our panel discussion, it'll be very lively because everyone will be in there, be like the Brady Bunch. We'll be at 100 boxes and all <laughs> catting away. So thank you so much. Welcome, guys. Uh, congrat First of all, congratulations on a beautiful piece of work. Uh, it's, uh, thank it's you. a privilege uh, when we have to sort of force to watch things. I mean, this year of COVID, I've not been watching much. So it's. Um, <laughs> Uh, it just feels like there is no cinema, there's no theater, there's no nothing. So go to work and just do what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's bringing me out of my COVID cave shelf. And it's such a pleasure <laughs> to do so, especially with something with such an incredible ensemble of performers and uh, working with one of our most revered and, and rightfully so playwright uh, uh, on, on a significant well, a significant body of work, but a significant film that you got all were entrusted with making. It's such an incredible story. So I just, I know Jen and I share, we applaud you all. Um, Jen being a native of Pittsburgh, applaud you even probably even a little more. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely, I forgot, yeah. Um, but it, it, it's really it's really quite a handsome film to watch and, and, and to fall completely in love with for the period of time, even as cruel as so much of it is. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not our, are not our prettiest times, and we're sort of still experiencing those ugly times now. Uh, so the story is still as rele relevant as ever. Uh, but anyway, we always like to start with just that the short question of your journey from from then to now, because uh, especially because of all the students that are out there watching, hoping to follow in your footsteps. Um, uh, but uh, for each of you, um, just tell us how you got here. Uh, you know, in you know, ten words or less. 20 words, take 40. Uh, well, I should, should I launch off? I mean, I actually, this is the, this is a, sort of an unbelievable moment to be able to, to mention the fact that how I got here was largely because of Jan Pascal here at the bottom of my screen. Um, and, 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 and Tom Walsh, uh, I might add. Um, the second film that I ever worked on um, and the first film that I ever worked on in the art department was as the intern um, on the original uh, film production of of The Handmaid's Tale, which was made, I think it was in 1989. Right? Take us back. And Jen was there too, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, exactly, exactly. So um, I, uh, you know, I uh, had my baptism um, with, with you two folks. And um, 
and was then off to the races, you know, it really sort of opened my eyes and, and, and taught me a few things and, um, you know, built from there. And, uh, you know, I'm so ple <laughs> unbelievably pleased to be here. Thank <laughs> you for not I, running away. I tortured you. <laughs> <laughs> there was no torture. It was, it was uh, you know, uh, self-fagulation or, you know, um, it was, it was uh, you know, the best, the best. Every spare moment I had, you know, was banging on the door to, uh, to work on that film. So, so uh, I, I very much appreciate it. And, um, you know, I, I absolutely feel that the, the, the dots connected because there are important relationships that you make everywhere, particularly at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had this conversation with Peter Franks, who did The Father earlier, and we were joking about the fact two of the two best jobs is to be the PA, because I said, because you don't know anything and you're forgiven for that. Mm -hmm. The worst job is to be the production designer because you're supposed to know everything and <laughs> nothing but crap. And you don't. So there you go. So you've gone to the other extreme now. I hope you're enjoying it. Well, <laughs> they both start with P, so I'll, uh, you know, I'll take it. <laughs> okay. Diana? Um, so I started in the theater with Jan Pascal <laughs> working as her prop assistant. First the intern, then the assistant. Then Jan went off to the film industry and I said to Cletus Anderson, who we both knew from CMU, how do I get into the film industry? And he said, ask. And I said, I'm asking. <laughs> and six months later, I was following Jan into the <laughs> film industry. And I always blame Jan. It's all her fault. No, yeah, she's an easy hit. Yeah. <laughs> you also used to run a B&B because I think Mark used to stay on her sofa, I heard. Yeah. I, absolutely. No, I mean, that was the next chapter when I sort of came out here uh, or went to LA and um, was a uh, uh, deer in the headlights. And, uh, and Jan took me again under her wing and gave me a sofa. And it was, you know, <laughs> the story goes on and on. Oh, yeah. Uh, you both took it from there. So thank you. <laughs> and? Ms. Karen. Well, I, I, I did not start with Jan <laughs> or Tom, <laughs> no, I, but you know what? I had similar mentors, you know, people that um, were forgiving and, uh, and just taught me, you know, baby steps at a time, what to do, what not to do about timing. Um, I think you're right, Mark. Every, all the relationships that you make from the very beginning are important. Um, and you you stay in touch and you build and you help other people and you work very, you know, it's very hard. You work hard and you just, uh, in, for me, I love all of it. So I just keep looking and looking around me and how people, uh, decorate their Zoom pages now. <laughs> it's great research. I mean, I'm always, I, I'm, I, it is, it's great research. It's a little, that's what I'm doing all the time. <laughs> that's so true. And, and I have to blame part of this on Karen too, because I met her working on a show in 1992. So wow. we go way far back. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. I didn't know that part. That's great. Yeah. Diana, were you? Yeah, she and I did lambs together. I was first. What's that? Were you at the Pittsburgh Public as well? Pittsburgh? I was at the Public Theater for three years, and then and CLO. Yeah. That's where I met Jan. And That's... I think I even interviewed with you one time, Tom. You were so lucky. I think <laughs> you didn't give it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get it. Yeah. God knows. Um, I can't remember what I had for breakfast, so forgive me. <laughs> Silence, Silence of the Lambs, right? Right. right. One of my favorite movies. That's a mean movie. Um, Jan, did you have? Uh... I have many questions because yeah. uh, period equipment. Talk about how, oh my God, it's such a challenge to get that right. And you all just nailed it. The recording equipment, the microphones, you know, even the piano in the basement. I mean, all of it. Uh, how, talk, tell us how you, uh, Karen and Diana, how you managed to come up with all of that and not have it look like it's 100 years old, <laughs> mm. which is a challenge. Well, Diana is, 
she was able to find, I mean, Di, you, you tell how, but she found uh, a collector um, who builds, uh, and an engineer whose background in his engineering. He has a passion for, for music and engineering. And uh, he builds um, all kinds of sound recording equipment from the beginning of recording equipment, you know, sound recording equipment. Wow. And um, Nick, his name is Nicholas Berg. And uh, go ahead, Di, you, you can take it from there. You, you found him. Well, you know, Mark asked me to start researching this because this was everybody's big concern. Mm -hmm. And as you're just rounding the internet, I came upon this PBS thing called American Epic. And it starts off with this beautiful equipment. And, you know, God bless Facebook. There I was going, I think I got the guy, Mark. And I <laughs> called him up on the phone, <laughs> said, hey. And and we were all kind of stunned because this, this because Nick had everything from, you know, the red light bulb and the, and all of the, you know, the different kinds of microphones and speakers and, and he had everything we had to, we didn't have to supplement very far because um, he brought working period equipment. And uh, I think he's done some other projects other than American Epic, but that in itself is just a joy to watch because he's using you the equipment and talking about the history and then modern uh, recordings of songs from the 20s, 30s, 40s. So American Epic is just so much fun to watch and we stumbled on it and he said yes wow that's where what part of the country was he in he's outside uh, outside of burbank he Are lived you in, like no. a half hour from karen's house <laughs> oh my god he, he lives in california he still does uh, a lot of recordings um for some for films but mostly it's, it's just out of his uh little studio behind his house he uh People who, musicians love to record on the equipment that the song was originally uh, recorded. He has the, all, all the, the various um, uh, techniques of recording the albums from the wax to the, you know, uh, shellac to, oh so, and he's, uh, you know, very fastidious and he had built, he gathers pieces for all these machines because they were all handmade and there weren't aren't that many of them right. um so uh anyway and then the pianos we just found you know pittsburgh is the whole midwest i think and is a treasure trove and uh of a lot of pianos that you know they're costly to to repair sometimes they're sitting in sh repair shops and you know, maybe haven't been touched. They're not v that valuable. Uh, and then it kind of, I would say, Mark and Di, don't you think it felt like there were just certain pianos? We found about six or seven of them. We felt right away there was something about them that just felt right for each space. Absolutely. I remember just like moving the, the photos around and, and we were all in complete agreement about, yeah, this should be that and that should be this. So, yeah. Yeah. So lucky to right. have so many to choose from. That's amazing. And can I say to your point, Jan, about the equipment? I mean, the fact that it was all brand new, you know, that Nick made it, it was it, it was just unbelievable. And that speaker, which I just was in love with, that big round thing, so beautifully painted. And, and it was all, it all worked. Yeah, it yeah. did. It was so, it was, it was just perfect. It really was. It was. I was, I'm impressed and I can't believe he said he's in Burbank. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised he's in Burbank, living up in the canyons. Um, <laughs> all sorts of those guys that you, you dream to have uh, use for at some point. Mark, this is, you know, obviously this is a period that's, thank God for photography, is pretty well documented, though when you get into the black culture and the performers, other than the performance stuff itself, it's still you're you're getting reaching for shards of information to put to go put together a whole idea. So how did you approach the research of this, knowing that you were going to be doing it on location and having to transform things? 
Well, we, um, you know, we had, we didn't have much time. Um, I met with George and, and was hired um, straight away and, uh, and went to the, I started as I often do. I mean, these days I started on the internet and I was looking at the recording equipment because I had some familiarity with the recording equipment from the James Brown movie that I did, but I, but I knew that this was gonna be something completely different. So I did start there just trying to understand what it was. Cause I felt like I needed to understand what that was in concept and shape before I could understand what the recording studio wanted to be. I mean, once we, I had an understanding of that and, and Pam at History for Hire, um, you know, connected the dots um, for me to this fellow at the Library of Congress, who at least I had a conversation with him. Right. And I explained it in the way that I said, you know, it, it's people like you that we don't want to look at the movie and be upset with us that we got it wrong. So he was able to just educate me. Um, and then, you know, I passed the baton to die. Um, the New York, New York City um, Public Library Picture Collection is where I always start because there's, you just find a wealth of stuff that might not have fa uh, found its way to the internet. Um, oh, I think we only found, there's only seven photos of Ma Rainey and you know from her world in existence. And, and even those are, are so limited. I think that the, oh. there's one with her uh, backup band um, on a little stage that had a backdrop of her logo, which was which was an eagle that was the only thing of you know real detail that we could that we could go with, um, you know. And then, as I say, you just start looking at what Chicago was. Um, really, you know, a lot of conversations with George um, in the in the beginning, where we talked about that the recording studio would have um, been appropriated into a into something else. You know, it wouldn't have been a building that was built for this. So it was. Uh, um, we decided it would be, it would make sense to be in a, in a factory of some sort. And then through our research on the ground, we discovered that the Paramount Recording Studio had actually been in an old chair factory. So we just ran with that detail because it made sense and it was perfect and it was fun. Um, and, um, you know, vaudeville theaters just looked at those we had, because we built that and it, we started with a location, but just to, to know what the language of that was and the scale and the tents, um, and the details of the city, Chicago, everything from the you know the elevated trains to the to the streetlights, and and what we would need to do to to transform our moment in Pittsburgh into into the story of Chicago in 1927. Ice trucks, you know, uh, graphics, all of that. You just we didn't have a gigantic list of sets to do, but um, you know they're all filled with the details that you want to get right. I'd say you did a, some serious aging there down in the basement. What used to go on in that basement? I'm going. <laughs> gnarly room well you know that basement was it was a set i mean that was entirely a set aside from the brick floor um we we built our sets in the 31st street um sound stages in pittsburgh um which was an old steel factory so it's not um the cleanest sound stage i've ever been in but what it did have was the remnants um the relics of an, an ancient old gang, uh, gantry crane and and the brick a lot of it was under a slab of concrete but in pieces it had it had crumbled and there was just enough uh footing real estate of the gorgeous brick that we just decided to place that band room down there but the rest of it was all um plaster work you know the scenics the great scenics on the job um created every one of those bricks and um the timbers uh, were real and, and we convinced the construction department to hollow those out so that we could put them in there and, and wild them, the four timbers that were in the corner of that wall. But yeah, no, it was a, it was all a set. Yeah, and, uh, just, right. You can't get carpenters to make things look like that. It's, it's really hard. Well, and I was worried about quite honestly, I was worried about it because that was the original plan. And then Jim Truesdale, the art director and I happened upon these timbers that weighed 6,000 pounds a piece. Yeah. <laughs> and I knew we had to, I mean, you know, the cracks were so deep and the knots were so rich and we were going to be right on them. So we, it took some cajoling, uh, definitely. We got a lot of no's and then we just, they, you know, that's how great Lou Taylor was for us there in Pittsburgh and, and Joe and they figured out, yes. they figured out a rig to, uh, to get it done. That's great. I'm glad to hear that. Yes. We dragged Louie out of mothballs, indeed. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> and he was perfect. He was perfect. Yeah. Absolutely. It, you, you all really nailed it. It was just, it was just right. It really, and, and I'm impressed that you fought for those timbers. 
<laughs> well, you know me, Jalen. <laughs> <I do. laughs> well, what, are, what were your takeaways, each of you, your takeaways from this show that made it a, such a, you know, a, a special experience? Oh, for me, it was just, it was every single thing. You know, when I, when I saw the film early, probably earlier than most, because we did one day of additional photography. And so I saw a rough cut, which is a pretty final cut. We, there were very specific things we needed to do. And my sense, if I can say this, was I just felt like I could see every single thing that every single crew member on that film in the art department did. I just, every single thing, I just like, there was nothing left on the floor. Um, that was not part of the story and, and the frame and the sets that we did. And, and I just couldn't have been more pleased because we worked really hard for, you know, it, we didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have a lot of time, but we had a lot of passion and spirit and the crew on that show. I think everybody knew we were working on something right. unique and special, um, you know, across the board, the subject matter, um, George Wolf, our cast, um, all of it, you know, it was just, it was, it was, uh, it was a special time. That's great. Diana? Uh, it was so fantastic to work with George and Mark because just Karen and I being in the room when George and Mark were, were speaking in, in, in metaphors and speaking in, in visual, that visual language that is so exciting to work in because they're not telling you I want a pink room, you know, they're telling you about the the warmth of it and they're they're describing it in such a way that you can hang on to that. And and it's so much fun to to bring that kind of thing to life. And 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 it's back to our theater days and back to that sort of way of working where it's not um it's not mechanical, it's not it's not uh, outcome oriented. It's it's a process, and the process is the part of it that I really love. Yeah, Karen. Uh, well, for me, it was my I hadn't been back to Pittsburgh, so that was really nice to work with Diana and with Lou. And you know, after I don't know so many years, um, but. I, our uh, graphics uh, person, Karen Tenick, who is a friend of, of Mark's was, uh, she and I had been, I, I think maybe having coffee or something. And she said that they were doing, you know, uh, this August Wilson play and uh, that Mark was designing and George was directing. And she, it was like, I, we have to do, Karen, you have, you must do it. You have to do it. and. I just felt somehow the same way, you know, I, it was so nice to go back to a place that I knew and I had spent, you know, I kind of learned a lot from way back then and so nice to, uh, it was a film about Chicago, which is my hometown. Um, and I, you know, uh, felt something, you know, I just sort of knew uh, certain things would be right that when I would see them because it just, re it's something you, you don't ever lose when you grow up someplace. And then like Mark said, the people were, uh, the crew, every single person, we had a very short prep and um, for this kind of a, a period film and the kind of research and things fell in place and everybody contributed and um, was very, it was a really col a great collaboration. I think that's all you can ask for a story and a great collaboration is what the reason to take something. Sure. It's really? always, it seems like a simple thing. Just give me a good story. And yeah. <laughs> Well, and I'll, I'll be there. Um, this is our lightning round because we have to wrap it up. But just uh, advice to uh, our, our younger audience members in terms of how to follow in your footsteps. What would you say? And you can tell them to go into insurance. That's okay. You can be honest. <laughs> well, I would go back to where I started with this is just, you know, um, pursue something really hard. I mean, if you want to do something just bang on the door and don't take no for an answer because that's how I got through that door. Somebody finally heard it. You know, they, 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 they heard that kid <laughs> was desperate to, to work on this show. And, um, 
I just, uh, you know, don't just keep keep going for it. I mean, that's pretty vague, vague but it, but it, it it was absolutely um, real for me, um, and it and it started my whole career. Karen. Yeah, I think you know, for me, I think also. I feel sometimes that when you're in school, you know, you may not uh, fit into sometimes as a, I all, I took a lot of art ever since I was a child. So I was always kind of doodling and sketching and, you know, sometimes maybe certain subjects are difficult and, you know, you may, it, it's okay to be an artist, I feel, you know, it's a good thing to be an artist and not to, and like Mark said, you, you can work hard, you can, you can um, just do it and you find, you'll find your, your, you'll find, you, if you find great joy in it, just, you know, don't worry about the things that don't come so easy. Mm -hmm. um, like, you know. Diana, real fast. Find your place. Find your uh, place. These relationships that you have in school will be the same relationships you have 35 years from now. Be kind to each other. Please remember that it is one big happy family. We are all going to be working together for our entire careers. It's the slot you're in and, you know, enjoy it. <laughs> well, thank you guys. You, the work was just fantastic and it was a pleasure and it's a pleasure to have your company and hang in there. We're gonna come back uh, with the panel. Donald, and Jan, I mean, as I've been saying to others, but more so for you, you guys are really uh, repeat uh, achievers here. Uh, uh, so you you know our audience, you know this experience, and you know the craziness that comes with uh, being a nom nominee uh, uh, and um, where how to give it proper measure because it's it's a great it's a great ride, but uh, your lives and your careers are more important than any one moment in time, and this is. It's a great time to have good times, and I'm even in these COVID, COVID bubbles we're in. So, uh, welcome back. And full disclosure, we've had this conversation uh, about a month before for Netflix. So, um, uh, I'll try not to ask the same questions twice, but I, it's going to be very hard not to. So, we'll, we'll that's okay, Tom. That's freshen okay. it up. <laughs> I wrote them all down the last time, so I have the answers already. I straightened out the answers this time around. Um, <laughs> Well, you know, one thing I remember, and we talked <laughs> about it, and it still is really critical, um, is this is not a documentary. This is, uh, to me, it's a, a dark love letter and, and nod uh, towards a time and place and a world that's long gone. I mean, the world of Hollywood doesn't exist anymore. And the way that these pe people created films and learned how to make films, that world is gone. Yeah. Um, or loved making films. Even the even the rat bastards that you had to work for, they all kind of liked the business. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. They weren't in it. I mean, they were in it for a lot of things, but they liked making movies. Yeah. And and they drank. Often, if you were really a fine literary personality like Mankiewicz, you you drank yourself silly because you hated what you were doing, but it was paying for your beverage of choice. So, it's you true. know, they you know, did pay. That's for sure. Did pay and they got paid really well at that time. They it's got paid really well. Yeah. So, um, but you know, this film for me is uh, it talks <laughs> about a story about the creation of film, a process that's fundamentally all, and it was a, a process of filmmaking from Citizen Kane that I think altered the DNA of cinema storytelling. To me, uh, as always, there's before Citizen Kane and there's after, and and it's so different, especially when you get into the late '50s and the film noir. And you see what the origins always go back to that way of telling stories and using mm -hmm. other media, newsreels, and people mm -hmm. talking over people and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I applaud you because, I mean, as a, as a group effort, a collaborative effort, you really capture the spirit of that without being precious about it. It really- Well, thank you. Yeah. Real story. So thank I'm going to get off my um, uh, uh, laudatory um, uh, box here and just sort of ask the basic because as you know a lot of our uh, uh, viewers are students and, uh, and educators and mm -hmm. colleagues and so we'll, we'll go back in the way back machine uh, uh, and just ask you the you know the short version of how you guys got from there to here and we'll start with you uh, Donald. How we got from there to here well <clears throat> you were born. I was born. 
<laughs> I grew up. I went to school. I went to college. <laughs> I went to art school and I ended up here. Yeah. And um, Mank came about when I was working on another project with David Fincher, the director, and we were doing a feasibility study for something. And um, we were meeting one morning and having coffee. And he said to me, and then after we do this film, there's one I want to do. It's black and white. I really want to do it. My father wrote it. And and I'll get you the script, you know? And my mind was so settled into what I was working on at the moment, you know? I thought, you know, I can't ride two horses at once here. So <clears throat> I sort of just kind of cataloged it. And then the project we were on um, postponed and he sent me the script. And of course I fell in love with it because A, it, it has to do with so many things that are dear to my heart. And, and I mean that honestly and sincerely. I mean, first of all, obviously the film business because it's, I've worked in the film business in one capacity or another for 40 some odd years. And um, it's, it's been one of the most wonderful gifts to my life. Um, the other aspect of the film that I found so, uh, um, I was so attracted by was the fact that it was all taking place in Los Angeles for the most part. And it was about the history of Los Angeles and it was about the history of film in Los Angeles. And, you know, I just love the city of Los Angeles. I, I, I love, my heart is dear and attached to California so much. Um, I just love living here and, you know, to be on a project that sort of has encompasses both of those elements, you know, is such a, is such a gift. And so, you know, during that time period, fortunately or unfortunately, I had several months where I wasn't working and I just took advantage of the time and started to do some research. And then David and I actually started the project, um, I don't know, six weeks or so before the official production started. And I just, um, as with every project with David, I begin it by just listening. Yeah. I think that's the... Um, well, that's a blessing to have that kind of a time because that's when there's no one pulling at you for this and that. You can just exactly. focus exactly. on the work itself and the what ifs and the how tos and wouldn't this be right. wonderful? That's great. Right. What a blessing. And, and David had been wanting to make this film for quite a, some time, I think from the some period in the 90s. I'm not quite sure of the date. Well, but... he said, and it was his father who wrote it. So, I mean, yeah, and his father wrote it and he was dearly attached to it. So, you know, to have that time, you know, to just absorb it and spend time alone with him and listen to what was in his head for many years about what he wanted the film to be was just invaluable. And, you know, when we finally got to the production stage, the schedule was truncated. The amount of time we had, the amount of money we had was not what we were used to on a David Fincher project, to be truthful with you. I think we shot it in 60 days and everything before that I had done with him had a shooting schedule of over a hundred days, I believe. And so this was a new challenge and it was period and we wanted to do it all in Los Angeles. And, um, I think the way the film came about and how we got here was actually during, quite honestly, during that six weeks. And I'm not taking away from all the work that was done after that, and certainly not by Jan and her team that came on because they were part of that sort of limited production. But for me, that time beforehand to sort of come up with a template and a framework from spending time with David and, you know, listening to what he had to say, I still think that you know, there are too many people in this world and this business that that talk too much and they're not enough that listen enough, you know? And I think listening is a valuable tool yeah. and especially with somebody of the genius of David. And so, you know, literally the first few days, I was just, I was just quiet and listening to what he had to say and what he thought of the film. And then we would get into the banter of, you know, what, what would work if we did it this way and what location could work if we did it this way and what would be on stage and what wouldn't. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> I think the getting to hear part, I think that six weeks was, you know, integral to getting to hear, yeah. you know. Well, you can get a lot. If that makes sense. It you know? does. You can get so a, a lot of really good work done. If, well, it's like building a house. You've got to build a foundation. And right. that time is the foundational work that pays off dividends to those that write the checks, but they don't seem to, they undervalue it so much that you have to fight for it. 
Right, right. The last thing they're going to do, what are you going to do in prep time? You know, you know, we're not paying you to prep. We're paying right. you to... To right. make a movie, to shoot it, start shooting. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we're not the grip department. You can't go and pull it off the shelf, guys. You know, you got. Yeah, it. I know, I know. We're talking about a story that's what eighty years old. Mm-hmm. No, I'm there. Yeah, you know, LA doesn't it, look like that the, anymore. I mean, you know more than anybody, Tom. The art department is not formulaic in any way, shape, or form. Um, you know, it. You know, from one show to another. You know, you can. You can sort of look at a, uh, an apartment and say, well, when I did this on this show, but it's never the same. It's never yeah. the same, you know. I put it to the land of misfit toys. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, Jan, your journey? The oh, Reader Digest journey. version? <laughs> yeah, the Reader's Digest version. Uh, you keep hearing a lot about Pittsburgh in all of these interviews today. Yeah, which, yeah. Uh, definitely my origin. Uh, yeah. Started out in uh, with Mr. Rogers, started as a scenic artist. Became prop master, started in theater. Can I interrupt you for a second? I, I've shared so many times your stories as being Mr. Rogers' prop mistress and breaking the <laughs> town. Didn't you knock the whole town down? His model it, it, town? Oh, no, no. Oh, I think you told me you dropped it. <laughs> well, I was, I was terrified to drop it, but no, I killed the fish. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the fish died. But <laughs> that was a big part of the show. But, you know, Mr. Rogers, George Romero, yeah. um, Pittsburgh Public Theater, um, and then, you know, paths, paths westward. Yeah. Um, and then fortunate enough to mutual friend of ours, um, Don's and mine, Krista Monroe, uh, suggested my name to Don and uh, I was, thrilled to to meet him and the idea of working with Don and David was really exciting so uh, if I haven't thanked you enough Don <laughs> you can you can stop thanking me now I mean I'm <laughs> thanking you for your contributions so you know it works conversely um it was a great experience yeah well this is a question for both of you and it's really about what about the, this work that we do this craziness that we enter into that still gives you the most joy? Uh, what aspects of this process do um, are really your, your, your blissful moments? I still, <clears throat> for me, it's so wonderful to walk in on a stage when the sets are being built yeah. and nobody's there right. <laughs> and it's empty. And I told this, I remember telling this to my agent on when I worked on House of Cards where it started off with, um, with David saying, I want to try to do it all on location. And then you cut to like a 240,000 square foot warehouse that's been converted into a stage, wall to wall with scenery. And, and I remember going there, I'm unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know, I'm one of those people that likes to get up at like three in the morning when I'm working and, and what you mean? get on with it, you know the deal. Um, <clears throat> but I remember just week after week there, going to the stage early in the morning and just sitting alone with the sets. And I remember telling my agent at the time, I said, you know, it's the one thing I trust. I said, because the sets are always honest to me when they're not working and when there are things that are problematic and when there are things that have failed on them, they're honest to me. And when they're working, they're honest to me. And in a very strange way, those physical sets are the only truth that I find sometimes. <clears throat> and I just enjoy having that quiet, peaceful time alone where you're sitting there on a stage and as, as silly as this may sound, you hear the wood expanding, you hear, you know, through the silence, you listen and you hear so much and there's just something wonderful about it. And you sit there and you think, you know, so many people brought all this together. Yeah. So many people made this happen and so many lives and so many contributions and so many thoughts. And I, that just means so much to me. It really does. You're reminding me very much of that wonderful scene in Chaplin when Chaplin walks onto the silent film stage in Hollywood for the first time. Mm-hmm. And it's just a tented dance floor. You know? mm-hmm muslin everywhere and the dance floor and just his silhouette right. walking through that empty space and it, it is a magical um experience uh, yeah. you can hear the ghosts yeah yeah, yeah. That's the truth that's a beautiful way to say it don i 
I feel the same. I feel like, you know, the, the, the joy that I get is that we're supporting the story. Yeah. And that if we sit in that room long enough and it feels right, that no one will notice, which we, we don't ever want to detract from the story that we're trying to right. tell. We just want to support it. And I think that when you have those quiet moments and you're sitting there and you're feeling, have I gotten it? Is it right? Have we all done our work properly? And it, it, there's something that if it's not right, it'll sing out to you. It, yeah. It's so true. There's truth, yeah. there's truth in the sets. And they're always that way, I find. And, um, you know, I, I don't like to draw attention to myself. I, I really don't even like doing this, to be honest with you. But <laughs> so I, I mean, being anonymous is the pinnacle of life in my mind. But, um, you Why know, you know this? <laughs> <laughs> the sets and the story and all that we do to to, you know, have the have the scenery and, and our work support the narrative that we've read you know, so many times over by the time we get to the stage and by the time we get to the sets, you know, it's, there's That's a quiet, good. you know, there's a quiet peace that you feel kind of when it comes together. And it's nice to have that time alone with it. Yeah. Now, you both had to go through a little bit of re-education uh, on, on the show. And what I'm referring to is, uh, I mean, you shot <clears throat> native digital black and white, which is an interesting <clears throat> thing to say. Um, uh, but as opposed to trans uh, transferring over to black and white, you shot it in black and white. Just correct, correct. It was film, but it was not. And, correct. and so there is a whole education that you guys had to put yourselves through to be seeing in the grayscale and judging things as to what they'll become. So explain for uh, us that process for each of you of coming to that point where you were confident in your, your choices and, and the, the tools that you're using to get to that point. Well, I think it started off with us thinking that we would do a lot of testing, which we did. We, we test, I think Jen, especially in props, tested a lot of elements. Um, and I just began by going out and just photographing in my neighborhood, just different textures, colors, whatever, and, and seeing what they did. Um, and then I think the seminal moment was when David <clears throat> said that we should just all that everybody, all the keys and their support team should um, put the setting on their iPhone to uh, noir when they take pictures. And that would be the standard. And I think the more I think about it and the more I've spoken about it, I think that was just a quiet little moment that just kind of changed the gravity of having to deal with black and white because all of a sudden everybody was looking at the same standardized image that they were photographing and it was you know everything became became easier after that because we all knew that we were all using the same the same filter and we got a because of that we got a better understanding of the black and white and what was good about it was that after a period of time and really not that much time a matter of weeks i think we all started to sort of have this artistic instinct toward what worked and what didn't because we had used that filter so much in our photographing of things that, you know, fortunately we got to the place where we kind of wanted to be where we were living in a black and white world because we started the film by looking at all this black and white research and specifically black and white research of places like, well, we found wonderful photos of Hearst Castle San Simeon. Sure from the period actually, and night photos from the period, which were just amazing in black and white. And, you know, you just would look at the image and you just so desperately wanted to just transport yourself and stand in there and be a part of it. And this sort of helped us with that, you know, the his taking and standardizing the, the format and how we would photograph things as we went around and looked for couches, chairs, wall hangings as I dealt with painting you know and all the sets you know we we knew it very early on that we didn't want to paint them in color we wanted to keep them in natural tones so that the actors felt comfortable in them and felt like they were in the real world yeah. because the actors come in seeing everything in color so it wasn't like we we painted 
you know, the um, the guest house in pink, you know, because it looked good in black and white. You know, we painted it in the natural tones. So there was a little push and pull with finding those values. But once we sort of came up with with a plan on it, it was it worked out really well, I think. <laughs> now, there were a few surprises. Uh, I was, you know, anyone who's ever done a, a movie where someone spends half the movie in bed, you worry about what color should the sheets be. Um, so we had about, I bought about 15 pillowcases in every shade from white, white to gray to beige and everything in between. And when we saw it on the camera test, oddly enough, white, white was the best. And that was shocking to, to me and helped my perspective of what, what we should present um, and, and to, to calibrate the grayscale in, in my head, as yeah. Don was saying, so that you kind of frame everything going from that. Um, you know, yellows would yeah. suddenly be brighter than white. Yeah. And it, was, it was really fascinating. But and it was odd because there were other instances where white was just blinding you know yes. it, it was just you know it was so distracting so it was it was an interesting experience that way you know now another important thing of that is part of the the citizen came lore and achievement <clears throat> the masterful use of deep deep focus photography mm -hmm. and, uh, did you guys try to apply that in any of your comp composing i mean it's hard because in digital everything's in deep focus. Yeah, so, exactly. You know, exactly. We're trying to get away from it because we're missing that. Right. Right. I mean, I. Don, the way you, know, you designed the, the the ranch house, I think, really showed that. Well, you know, we were trying to add depth and layers to things, but we always do that anyway. And, you know, I don't think it. It certainly wasn't a situation. I mean, I was on with David the other day, and we were talking about that with somebody, and it wasn't like you say, oh, don't worry about that. It'll be out of focus. I mean, I'd never approach anything that way. You know, it's like, it just, that's not an option, whether it's deep focus or not. So, you know, it really didn't have any effect. It's like every corner has to be done correctly, whether it's five feet away or 50 feet away from where you think the action is going to be. Because as you know, Tom, I'm sure you never know what's going to happen, right? We don't have any control of the edit. Um, yeah. Speaking of which, I'm being told that we need to wrap it up. So I want to. Oh, really? Uh, I know we could go on for another hour, uh, but that, we'll say that. Oh, I rambled too much. Ooh, no, sorry. no, no, it's fabulous. But I do want to end with, uh, you know, the, the, the words of wisdom to those that want to follow in your footsteps, both of you. What advice, quick advice would you give them? Jan? You know, um, as a decorator, pay attention to surroundings wherever you are and be able to think of ways to translate that into an environment that you're creating and uh, be willing to do, <laughs> start your career as you're hearing from people today, to willing to, to start anywhere and to do anything and you have to love it or don't do it. I would say um, <clears throat> find a story that you're attracted to that touches your heart if you can um, something that you can pick up and read, not only in this moment, but six weeks down, 10 weeks down, 12 weeks down, you still find interest in it, and it would still have meaning to you. And besides that, you know, understand the importance of silence, because I think in silence, sometimes you can listen to your own ideas. And you know, creating is a process, you know, as I was talking with David the other day, it's a process where you start at A and you go through the whole alphabet. And before you know it, maybe you come back around to A, but that journey through the whole alphabet to get back to A is so important. It's the, it's the Jasper Johns thing of take an object, do something to it, do something else to it, and then come, maybe come back to the object as it was. Mm -hmm. Well, well said. Guys, I uh, look forward to seeing you on the panel, and I just want to thank you so much for inspiring us and continue to raise the bar, bar high for all of us. So Thank you, Tom. It's good to see you again. Yeah, always a pleasure. Take care, yeah. guys.
David and Elizabeth, welcome so much uh, for joining us and, and just congratulations on some Thank magnificent you. work. Um, those of us who've worked in New Mexico a lot know how challenging can be, especially with something 146 years in the past. So, you know, you've really done yeoman's work and it's, it's on the screen. It's just fabulous to watch. Thank so you. we like to always start with our, our question um, for a lot of people in the audience, especially the students. And it's really to share a brief memory of your personal journeys that brought you uh, into our profession. So this is the Reader Digest version, it can be short. <laughs> okay. Can I go first? Yeah, sure. Sure. Okay. This is just my past, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My cleaned up past, which is not really, really not all that dirty. <laughs> um, I, I started in theater um, many, many years ago, and I, that's what I studied. I studied art, art, studio art, drawing and painting in school, and then went to graduate school at Carnegie Mellon for theater design. And I worked in theater for about 10 years doing sets and costumes, and then kind of gradually changed over. I began first as a scenic artist mm -hmm. and on a film, and that was about five years before I transferred over, and then worked my way up that way. So I've been doing, I was an art director starting about 1990, and then started designing, designed a little bit. Then I went and worked with Jack Fisk for about six years. And then he said, enough, and left. be out, get out of here, go do it yourself. So that was about 2006 or seven or so. So that's, that's my short, long of it. Yeah. Or long and short. Very cool. Very cool. Elizabeth? Um, I had always been a very creative kid and my parents nurtured that. Um, I ended up going to University of Texas at Austin and studied advertising and psychology. And I needed to support myself in a creative manner. And so I did that for many, many years. Um, but I always noticed the production side of, of the commercials that we were shooting. Everyone was having so much more fun. And I had an opportunity once to uh, take a, a, a wild gamble and go to the Czech Republic and try to work on a film and get a job on a film and kind of shift careers. And I just thought, let's, what do I have to lose? Nothing. So I put my apartment into storage and off I went. I didn't have a job. I just gambled. And the night that I arrived, I was with a very good friend of mine who offered me this wonderful uh, opportunity or this, uh, uh, this gamble, if you will and had dinner with the production designer and some of the actors and the DP and got a job that night. And from, it just changed my life forever. And I think being on set, I was a PA, but I was kind of an onset dresser. Um, and just looking at the castles and palaces um, and civic buildings that we shot in, uh, and the camaraderie, it changed my life forever. And I, I just absolutely loved it. And I, once that film wrapped, we traveled for a bit, but then I moved to Los Angeles with this friend of mine and who's now my husband of 20 years, um, but uh, came back to LA and struggled for a while, but got into commercials and made connections. And uh, Martin Childs was that production designer that gave me my first opportunity. And I just never looked back. I just loved it, loved it, loved it. And um, I've just tried to take a lot of chances and take any opportunity that was thrown my way and just jumped in with both feet first. Oh, you're giving me goosebumps. That's such a great story. <laughs> wow. And, and I, I really love that the family part of what we do. It's really important. And the way we choose our crews and you know pull that little family together for a specific amount of time is super important. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You all know. I work I work with the designer once on just as an assistant on a little Broadway thing. I don't know if you're John Lee Beatty. And, uh, oh, yes. no, yeah, no. and he told me in my interview, he goes, you know, I figure by the time people get to me for an interview, they can draft, they can build a model, they can do all these things. He said, I am really just looking for someone who's good for lunch. <laughs> that <laughs> is a, that's a very famous story and it's true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all true. Cool. When, when did you graduate from Carnegie? Just as an aside. Uh, 84, 1984. Yeah, well, that was a little, uh, my wife graduated in costume design, but that, she, I think she graduated in 78, 79, so. Oh, uh, right, okay. She was with uh, John Chapman and that whole group. They were oh, right. gotcha, right, that was right before me. Yeah, well, Jen, did you have a question? I have many questions. I know, I do too, but I'm gonna, you know, <laughs> lady first. So I, uh, 
I had a little sneak peek and uh, with David uh, at one point, and he told he told a little bit, David, about how you both had to you you kind of you didn't go very far. Uh, sometimes you were shooting the same town yes. from different directions and reconfiguring it. And we were just talking with the folks on the father who were using the same apartment layout. And right. how do you translate that to a town? And and you you both did it so beautifully that unless I had heard that story, I wouldn't have known. So well, good. <laughs> cool. Glad to hear that. <laughs> um, we we looked at actually a lot of towns. I mean, you know, yeah, a, a lot of movie branch towns, um, but. Or some of them just needed so much work and they really didn't figure very long on screen right. and it was not worth it financially to try to do that. So we, we kind of re, um, re kind of gathered about a month or so into it and decided that we would try to do it all, the first three towns on, in the one town. Mm -hmm. So I had the real pleasure of having Darius, the DP, with us for a long time. He came um, about three weeks after I got there and was there for the whole rest of the time. So we really plotted out those that uh -huh. town as to how we could enter it three different ways and what we could save and preserve for each okay. town yeah. um, and, and what kind of changes we would do. So we did, we mapped it out pretty well. And I think we also, um, we were able to do a lot of work for the whole town, which was a whole lot more efficient to get all the towns ready at once. Right. And then, kind because of, we only had, it was, it was like five days between wow. each shot. They did it in, they did it shot in continuity, which was wonderful for the little girl and wonderful for a lot of things, but it meant, you know, they'd leave for five days and go to and then they were back and we had to have a change. So we were able to get interiors ready early and that kind of thing. Right. Um, and then we did use another town and then San Antonio changed all about a week and a half before we were going to film it, they decided. They didn't want to travel as far to the place we were going to use. And so we had to find all new locations and, and put it together about 10 days. So, you know, it's the same thing. Everybody kind of gets yeah. thrown at them. <laughs> so, so was Bonanza Creek your, your town? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Know, know it well. Yeah. I mean, it was really pretty wonderful because it had been there long enough and stuff had yes. added on organically and it didn't feel yeah. like an Easter egg and like it had been put together by no. one hand. No, and you know, that was really nice. Those towns, like uh, uh, in the uh, streetcar named Desire and Blanche de Bois, they depend on the kindness of strangers. Exactly, <laughs> and and they deteriorate fast, which was the yes. good thing for you guys, yeah. because uh, as we know, it's impossible to car get carpenters to build things out of square, right. and you need that that you know, that noble rod of time. I mean, I, I noticed very much in that you know, one of your stable roofs in the beginning. Yes. You know, <laughs> yeah. They didn't build that. Nature helped them out there. <laughs> and thank heavens it stayed up for our entire shooting period. Because I yeah, wasn't yeah. really sure. Right. No, it's fantastic. But it's the logistics. And that's really yes. what goes to my that's, question. Because that's yeah. what I want to ask Elizabeth. How, the logistics of getting all that you had to get to that to those places. And everyone thinks okay. the Western's easy, but you know, we're, we're talking about 146 years ago. People don't do post-Civil War very much. So even no. for, for wardrobe, that must have been insanely difficult because those that, that fashion's not there. You know, right. you have to really cobble it together. Right. And and the props and all the set dressing without looking like it's so old that it's not real. Yeah. Right. right. Well, how, how did you do that? <laughs> well, we um I found a great buyer there named Anthony Whitman, who had been an antique dealer for quite a bit of time yeah. prior to getting into the film business. And he had so many interesting contacts. Nice. Um, Anthony Whitman was his name. And he and I met so many strangers and he introduced me to private collections and you know unusual characters with uh, uh, entire homes decked out yeah. with... Uh, yeah oddities that of course it was like just you know my eyes just popped out of my head and there were two prop two or three prop houses and a prop master also in albuquerque and uh santa fe and surrounds that we really uh plundered and did uh flat deals with them and they had a lot of fabulous stuff and obviously online and things like that so um, it was mostly local. Everything was local. I just really dug and prep. It was seven days a week just to get yeah. kind of ahead of that eight ball and really be ready for anything they threw at us at the last minute in curveballs. 
Yeah, and Tom, if I may, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, you're also blessed because you're working in an area where there's crews that really know how to make westerns. They do yes. that. They're really so. There's it's all second hand to them. You don't have to exactly take yeah. them to 101. They're taking right. you, helping you. In exactly. The so, yeah. They're taking me on an adventure. Also, um, a lot of the wranglers there and the l legitimate cowboys, the saddle collections, the blanket collections right. were fabulous. And our prop master made sure that our saddles had the right big horns on them. And there's nothing that could be out of place or out of time because it would take you right out of the moment. And so getting every single detail, including uh, the blacksmith's anvil and the way the leather was strapped to some of his, uh, or to the, that character's uh, wooden stumps all had to be meticulous and perfect and, and just all based on massive research that we did before we even started the film. So. Right. Um, yeah, we relied on a lot of the knowledge of our local people. And yeah. but how, did, how did you handle lighting? Because the lighting was so perfect. And <laughs> I find so much that we're lighting the sets now. Yes. Yeah. So, and you're 150 years ago. How did you, how did you convert the lighting? Or you well, work the lighting, I guess. Darius and I had many conversations um, in prep. And lighting is always so important to me. And he was excited that somebody was as obsessed with it as he was. Um, so I had uh, broken down um, every segment of the script into every town that we go into and kind of thought about the look and the texture and the colors and which, which lamps or lights, gas lighting, uh, quail blubber lamps would work. Um, and we really wanted to use all uh, gas lighting and nothing electric at all. And that's how we started. Um, we found some beautiful collections of, of even older lighting from France and England that were someone might have brought over with them or had like that one last heirloom that had survived. Um, and we really started out doing that, but some of these buildings in these towns are fire traps. And we have to, had to be very careful, especially the opening wool barn. And we had yeah. almost boy, two tons of wool in that barn. And it was so dry and the wool had been pulled through the cracks of the um, upper area. And we definitely uh, rewired a lot of those lamps and we rewired, we had a huge teams, you know, standing by to do all that. And it was a big deal, the lighting mm -hmm. um, and fixtures, the fixtures department with um, Orlando Hernandez, who was our uh, gaffer um, really, uh, headed that department up and really made sure we were completely taken care of. But it was always a challenge to find something new and different in bulk as well. Okay. David, I think they did, they did kind of pass down an edict that we had to turn, had, they all had to be electric. The interiors, case. yes. Yeah. But yeah. exteriors yeah. could be, yeah. yes. Well, it, 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 it translated very well and they were able to disguise when it wasn't uh, a right. original light. I mean, that's the thing that's compelling about the whole movie is it just feels so visually honest. Yeah. Right. It, it doesn't feel like you're walking, watching a, a movie Western in any way. It's a journey and it's an odyssey and, and you're with them. How did you manage your location? Because it's so much real estate that theoretically you could use. And you know, obviously you have to be somewhat uh, realistic in terms of right how far you can take the army on any given day. How did you uh, right. go about scouting the locations? Cause you've got a lot of action pieces. We did. And we, um, I had a great location scout, Clay Paris, oh, yeah. who um, we went, we, he and I started very early and we kind of went through and we got made kind of a big collection of all the kind, Paul always wanted to have these transition pieces mm -hmm. between each town that were landscapes as a character. So we kind of made a big collection of looks but you know you can go what thirty you know the thirty mile circle that you've sure. given generously. <laughs> so and we had to cover the four hundred miles in that thirty miles. And unfortunately, around Santa Fe, because of its elevation, you do get more yeah. choices. So that was actually quite useful. We narrowed it down to about four or five pieces of property. I mean, one piece of property was I don't know, it was like twenty by thirty miles or something. Oh. It was huge, and that really was most of the kind of barren landscape. And we used one of the uh, Pueblos, um, the kind of the wooded areas along the river, which mm -hmm. unfortunately I just heard burn the other day, completely down, <sighs> 200 acres. Yeah. Um, and then we used a lot on uh, Bonanza Creek Ranch, right. 
we just, you know, towards the end, it was kind of steel bar and bag trying to find all those little pieces without moving anybody. So it was, it was a lot of maneuvering, but then, and they did some kind of second unit stuff in distance just to get some of those landscape shots. And you had some visual set extensions? Uh, or you know, I think I think they're a lot, and I think they did them beautifully because you can't see yeah, them. They can't they're, they're, no, they're all along the edges of things, and they really yeah. did a nice job. Yeah. Um, most of in the towns, really, when they're shooting, everything around them is real. I mean, what they extended down streets yeah, and the course. heights of some buildings and stuff. The only kind of total visual thing was entering San Antonio, which they yeah. did a beautiful job on. That was a 30-foot dirt road across a casino parking lot. And then it was his. <laughs> yes, I, I, yes we, uh, we've, been, we've lived that way. I, I took no pictures of that. I didn't really oh. want to remember that. Part. Would you believe what we did yesterday? <laughs> I know. It's like you're afraid they're going to get out, you know, this yeah, picture. Yeah. Um, the, 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 his home in San Antonio I found particularly uh, uh, poignant. And uh, that, that reminded me of a lot of houses I've seen in Santa Fe. That was a museum house that was part of the historical society, and yes. um, they, they were at Golandrinus too. I could tell Golandrinus was the yeah. farmhouse. They yeah. which we, um, so, yes, that was a lovely piece of property. And we used that; it had a whole different feel, kind of the landscape. So we used that for that area around San Antonio. But um, right. really blended together, just just impeccably. Um, yeah, so we had a beautiful house that was really probably even more correct. But then we then they decided it was too far and we weren't going to go. And so we did. So I was telling Elizabeth, as I always kind of love when they suddenly say you have to find new locations because it's like, oh man, we're, we're going to get it right this time. You know, we have a second chance here. <laughs> so well, even when you have three days to find them, it's kind of, somehow better stuff comes up. So it's, it's yeah. my yeah. rule is never fall in love with anything because you get no. your heart smashed every time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we're going to have to conclude, but an important last question that we always like to ask, because of again our, our audience is, what what uh, advice would you have or or of encouragement to offer to those that want to follow you into our profession? What would you say to them to do? What's that line from Devil Wears Prada? Just gird your loins. <laughs> and head out. Too late. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, I'll let Elizabeth go on first on that one. <laughs> Well, I, I, one thing I left out, um, that first job that I got overseas, I offered to work for free. And I think that to find the film offices of whatever city that you're in and find out what films are coming or what films are nearby and offer to work for free and have that attitude of I'll do anything. And with that attitude, and if you can continue that for years, uh, it'll take you very far. But I think you really have to find somebody or find some kind of connection um, and just be diligent and don't take no for an answer and don't take things personally and just keep pushing and pushing and don't give up. Yeah. Tenacity is key. I think you just have to also make sure it's really what you want to do, because if you want to do it, yes. it will work. Yes. And you'll, and you'll make it work. But if, you're, if your heart's not in it, I mean, it ain't going to work and it's not going to be fun. <laughs> it's not going to be fun for anybody else around you. So. I mean, I, don't, I always just say, just, just find something that you really like. And, you know, if this is it, that's great. But you just remember you're in it kind of to have fun as much as to make a living. So. That, I think it's that's easy to good. say from my end of a career. So it's, <laughs> but, <laughs> well, you know, that's why I always feel, uh, I say the producers have such an advantage on us because they know we really love what we do. Exactly. Huh. And so when, when they realize that you're, you're dead. <laughs> yeah. I know. But I think you kind of have to take everything they say as a slight bit of a challenge Absolutely. You know, and, and not get bent out of shape about it. If they say, say, sure, give me 10 minutes, you know, <laughs> and you'll come up with something. Yeah. And you, then you're kind of the hero because you came up with something. So, sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> but, Walk away and solve it. You don't have to solve it right there on the spot. But just, right. But well, I think you have to kind of always, like you said, don't get don't fall in love with it. Don't become precious with it. It's just, you know, you got to get it up there. And it's, then it becomes kind of fun. You know? yeah, yeah. My other motto is failure recovery. We, we should always embrace failure because we usually do better <laughs> yes. when we're faced with adversity. Yeah. So, you know, just plot on. Well, guys, yeah. just beautiful work. It was, I, yeah. I, I, I hated that it ended. I wanted to see the next chapter because she's such a lovely writer, the, the novel. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the book was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It, it was really just, it was an interesting story that you would never have heard. And it no. was, shoot them up. It and they were lucky with that little girl. 
Oh, oh she was, ah, it she was amazing. Cool. Break my heart. I know. Yeah. yeah. So I watched it again this right after it was <laughs> over. I had to watch it. Again. <laughs> well, you know, you got fans here, guys. So oh, we'll, we'll, um, can't wait to get everybody else up on the big screen, and then we can all yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We'll talk soon. See, see you, you at the real thing, hopefully. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Nathan and uh, Kathy, welcome uh, back as, uh, as I say, repeat offenders or achievers. <laughs> uh, as always, uh, brilliant work. Uh, uh, I, I have all sorts of questions. Unfortunately, we only have like 20 minutes, uh, 17 if you go by what the, the uh, Ubers tell us. So we'll, we'll, we'll try and keep it succinct, but, but welcome. And again, congratulations on uh, no small task, a well executed. Um, as always, we like to start with just because you know our audience is, uh, is our colleagues and many students and and uh, uh, educators and such. So we like to always get uh, you know the the short version of your journey from there then to now. So and I think this is pretty well rehearsed for both of you. But yeah. we'll start with uh, Nathan. <laughs> uh, I'll go quickly. Um, started <laughs> went to art school. Uh, worked for some architects, got on a plane to LA, went into a bar, bumped into <laughs> a guy <laughs> to art school with who was working on Hook, and he said they need some people, and I got a job drafting, which I knew how to do, uh, set designing, um, and uh, Norman Garwood and uh, Tom Sanders and Andrew Precht, who were on that film, got me into uh, into the set designers guild, that they were separated at that time, and um, uh, and then the sort of rest is sort of history. I just sort of worked my way up the art department. How have I never heard that story before, Nathan? I've been here a million times. You, this is like your fifth time here. I've never heard, I never heard the drinking part, though. That's very I, I usually exit that one. But it was really, it was a paramount. It was, you know, Smalls, when Smalls. Oh, yeah. Uh, a, I went in there. I was just like, I was doing some architectural drawing. Right. I think I was actually working on Tom Cruise's kitchen, uh, drawing it for the architects or something. Yeah, it would make uh, sense. I was bumped into um, Joe Hodges, who's an old friend, and uh, he he was at art school with me. So he sort of said, hey, you get up here quick. They need people. So. <laughs> <laughs> and Kathy? It's sort of the same thing. I went to um, art school for interior design and uh, then I got a job in New York in an interior design firm. Then I moved to Los Angeles and thought I could get a job in interior design, but I got a job in the movie business um, as a researcher, then as a set dresser, then an on-set dresser, which was a disaster, and then uh, set decorator. And here I am. <laughs> then, no. Boy, that's a condensed version. <laughs> very quickly well it gives us more time to talk about the past and the future and the present so um uh -oh. you know i want to lead off and then jan's going to follow me about what where when and how many countries many miles many languages much crew how did you conceive, organize, break down this work, which is set in multiple and overlapping forward and backward time spaces and places? It sounds pretty simple. Uh, I have visions of you being up in um, uh, the garage of your of your um, your main uh, uh, <laughs> partner in in, in cinematic uh, challenges and crimes, with maybe a glass wall between the two of you this time, so you well, know no, different. Well, time I actually got into it. We built a turnstile. I got in it. I went back to the <laughs> I went back to the the end of the film. <laughs> we started the end and oh, why not? <laughs> no, I mean Chris, as usual, he's sort of oh, when you come for lunch, usual conversation. <laughs> Read the. He says I don't have the third act, which is very unusual for him. He says I don't want to show it to you. He does have it because he always has it. He says I don't want to show you it yet. And he wrote, he gave me the first two, and it was like I I, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> because it was the most, actually, uh, there was no visual way of, you know, when you read a script, you sort of, you immediately imagine it, uh, and right or wrong, it's your vision, your word off the page. This one was like, 
I don't see it. I don't see how this works. And uh, so he, um, we got there through a lot of sort of whiteboards and diagrams because the trick of Tenant is to, apart from the end, which is why he didn't show me the third act, is it's a point of view. You're going with a character on his time journey, backwards or forwards. It's a continuous thing. It's a constant thing. And um, so once you see it in POV, uh, it was like, oh, what a relief. Um, but yeah, and the problem with, well, actually, because we made all these other films around the world, different places, it was like, well, we have all these great crews everywhere. Uh, and so why don't we get everyone together and go to tons of countries? I mean, it's a spy film, so you've got to go to lots of countries. Uh, it's, a, with that, it's a spy film with that science fiction element. And I'll stop well, it's like James Bond at its best, but it's most frenetic. You yeah, know. it's just that thing in it. It's the time thing, which is yeah. uh, well, it's the inversion, the entropy element. It's not really time travel. So that's the difficult bit. Yeah. I want to see that whiteboard. <laughs> yeah, I need I, that I mean, diagram. Confused. <laughs> I mean, they're all difficult, Chris's films, and they're all complex, and there's always something. I'm going to ignore that. And uh, But with this, it was like, <laughs> I don't even know what to ignore. <laughs> it was exciting. Did you ever have to submit a budget? Oh, yeah. It, we always, I mean, <laughs> Chris is a very firm believer of like bringing it in for a number. It, it, it's done because we've all worked together so many times. It's like the slice of the pie. It's like, let's, sure. let's try and do this in one day, this budget stuff, so we don't waste time. And it's like, this is the pie. You can have this much. What can't I have? You know, <laughs> so it's it's quick, but it's tough. There's, you know, I mean, there is no film that has enough money. No, of course not. But did you have one budget for the future and one for the past? Well, yeah, we went back and replenished it. So, <laughs> well, as you convert yourself, you lose money, unfortunately. Yes, so you gain it. I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god but yeah, it was a road no. show so you're working with all a lot of your same usual suspects yeah we pulled in i i always pull in uh, eddie from iceland as i say he's worked with us for years and his icelandic crew who uh shone in on the tough beaches of dunkirk because right. they would stand out there and go swimming in that sea <laughs> I don't know, just, so he immediately joined us like, we've got to go to india eddie I kind of need you, you know, <laughs> so, and then we had set deck, we had uh, some French people, um, and we had Estonians who were great, we had some great Italians, some, the guy in Denmark was terrific as well, um, uh, just so many different crews, UK, we had, you know, construction Paul Hayes from, from the Dark Knight days, and then of course Joey Andreco always works as our construction manager, was there with the, um, the, the, the heavyweight construction guys who were willing to go in horrible temperatures to build that Stars 12. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I mean, I never, the recognition that construction really need is never really described anywhere because they are the backbone of the film. Um, and we have lots of departments, but, uh, uh, you know, set deck props, etc. But the, the, those construction guys are, are the pure sort of force of physical filmmaking. So. Well, in, in your case too, you uh, you and Chris, you guys like to do a lot in camera, more than people appreciate, right? Would you, would you yeah, I good? mean, we give it a go until we can't. And, you know, the bar is, <laughs> I mean, Chris is like, we got to do it. It's up, you know, most people give up here. He's like, no, no, we can do it. And um, so, yeah, we're going to, I mean, I just, you know, we're going to go and do it. We're going to land a giant MI9 Russian helicopter on a real boat. And we we'll all have to hide under the couches and hope, hope, it, hope the pilot is good. You know? and so, um, yeah, no, everything is like, there's no, never a question actually that we're not going to actually, the 747, that's a, you know, obviously without its engines, its faked engine, that's a real full size 747 going into a building that we built, a, that we got, I, we bought a Victorville, our producer bought a plane. Right. And, made it nice and then pushed it, built a building to crash it into. So, um, I mean, I guess we went from miniatures to <laughs> full size. Yeah, no, because yeah. you've got the, your own sort of uh, uh, rapid prototyping uh, uh, outfit that you take with you everywhere. So I figured you were just building uh, large miniatures. Well, I thought, I immediately thought, oh yeah, Chris, we just built this large miniature like Dunkirk and 
you know, a plane. And then he was saying, well, we've got to do all the stuff on a real plane with the gold and the takeover and the air slides. And so he says, if we get an old plane from Victorville, build me, rather than do a bunch of miniatures, let's just build a building and throw the 747 into it, which sounds simple, but not for special effects and cables and weight loads. And you're working in a real airport, which is, um, and you're chucking out fake gold, but Kathy's fake gold bars out the back. <laughs> so were those sounds all done in post of those bars? Because they sounded real. <laughs> no, they're, 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 there's like a lot of gold bar. I mean, they've got metal plates, they're metal plated plastic, basically. Yeah, so okay. uh, yeah, they, 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 you don't want to get hit on the head with those things. <laughs> like, uh, but Kathy, ships and tents and airplanes and I mean, was there anything untouched by what you had to do? You know, ship doors are hard enough and all the stuff that goes with that. And you were in all those crazy places. How, how, how did you get things wherever you were? Jan, I think most of it was having a crew that just would not stop until we found it. I mean, it was just, we just kept, we, like Nathan said, we just kept going and going and nothing, you just didn't settle for anything. You, you, you wanted to get to the end or the best product that you could find. And, it, you know, in Italy, it was kind of hard um, because in the summer, everybody's on vacation and things get shut down there. Oh my God. They have their priorities straight there. Yes, they do. Uh, so that was actually, I think that was the most difficult place um, to source things was Italy. Wow. We brought we brought a lot of stuff with us because we figured that during that time period, it was going to be difficult to find things there. But um, that was the hardest for me. But how many how many countries did you shoot in? It was, I know it was an around the world adventure, but seven seven countries, oh. including. I mean, I, Kathy, I think, um, that, I mean, India, Mumbai was, it was, you know, just chaos. And we're trying to get on the, <laughs> the uh, gateway of India tourist boats, you know, the chug chugs around there. And they're like, you know, is this thing going to sink? So <laughs> it's like, too. I'm going to get cholera in that water. <laughs> <laughs> but see, they believe in reincarnation. So it doesn't, it's not so bad. <laughs> I, that was my favorite place though, I think, India. Oh yeah, oh amazing. yeah. Mumbai is amazing. I you think. can't be a designer without going to India. It changes your whole perception of life and color and reality and texture. It's a, it's a phenomenal. I mean, it's what a great pleasure to be in a business that actually gives you that much frequent flyer miles and takes you to those places and pays you to be there. Yes. That's why we, it's the opiate that keeps us coming back for another shot. So that's that's fantastic. So is there any science behind what you guys were doing? Or were you really just making up pure science fiction? No, there is, there is, the entropy is a real thing. And you, you know, it is a, well, I mean, it's not a real thing. No one's actually done it. It's a, it's a, um, <laughs> ongoing study. No, no, no. It's a, <laughs> it's a, 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 a physics. It is a, a possibility in physics. Uh -huh. So, uh, uh, it's a theory. How about that? That's the word I was looking for. It's go. a theory. And so, if you can, uh, you know, if you take the physics of it, we, we definitely, Chris definitely wanted to hold to some rules. So, uh, and I think he always does that, you know, whether we're heading into a slingshot around a black hole or <laughs> being inverted to, um, to basically do a pincer maneuver on, on, on an event. So, I mean, those were the hard things. It was like, okay, if we're going to, because the thing about, uh, you can't just invert yourself. You have to, you're going, your timeline's going backwards now and you're going backwards. So at some point, unless you want to go backwards to the end of your life, because you don't grow, you go older backwards, you've got to find another turnstile to come back. So there, there was a lot of rules in it. So you have to look at the event and go, well, there was a turnstile. We were, we were involved in a turnstile you know, 20 days ago at the Rotor's Fault. So if we go to Seder's place and go back, we can come back through there. So there's lots of doorways. And then sort of on top of that, the protagonist or the man with no name, which is a sort of, you know, spaghetti Western thing, is, um, you know, he 
he uh, you know, he doesn't know that he's he's like the prisoner of that film series. Yeah. He is like number six. He is in fact sent Neil uh, backwards to solve the problem forward. So the film actually finishes before it starts. Uh, you know, in that timeline. So because when you see Michael Caine, he goes, "Oh, there was an explosion last week," uh, and that's the explosion at the end of the film. So. Um, Anyway, I mean, listen, there's bits I don't get, but it's like... Okay, I have, to, I have to ask one quick question of Nathan, because Nathan is one of the people... Sorry, Kathy, I have to ask him this question, because <laughs> you use all kinds of wonderful old school techniques that you employ all the time. You're one of the biggest proponents of using tried and true film tricks so yeah. to speak. I want to know what, because I couldn't find them. I was looking for them. So the, the most difficult and sort of daring one I think we did was an interior of when uh, when uh, he's being told, we're being explained that the back was bullet, you've got to catch the bullet. JD is like in there and we then we go into the storeroom with all the drawers. Yes, that uh, freaked me out. So if yeah. we, that was on location and we sort of thought the set was boring. So we pushed one more location out and built a bit more of the set into the parking lot, but it was still not long enough. So then we painted an, a set extension on a back wall of a location uh, that was set extended for real. And then we parked Chris and his camera. It was like, Chris, you, you, you have to shoot the JD's reverse from this point and this point only. So and actually, you look carefully drifted. It's like, dude, you, you drifted off. <laughs> It's like you, the perspective's gone. So that, I think that was fun. I mean, you, I think you can only really do it. Um, like in, in the cave, there's a forced miniature of a corridor. Um, but I think you can only really do it if you, you're doing it with the director and the DP. You have to do it together because uh, they fall apart otherwise. But they're, so we carried in our art department, uh, David Packard, who uh, is a scenic painter who we just take with us everywhere now. Uh, he painted. Dunkirk to cut out the boats and uh, he, he so we just put we have him in the art department and he goes like paint that he just paints backings all the time so for us so there's lots of backings in there and then um, uh, yeah so that's part of our art department now is him yeah it's good it's a good person to have yeah. you're a narrative artist so you need those yeah um, we're gonna go into the final round here because um, we could talk forever about the past and the future, but we'll have to save that for the panel. Uh, we do want to end, though, by asking each of you just that, that sort of question that we do with everyone is any advice or encouragement you have to other people that want to follow you into this profession? Uh, Kathy? Ooh. Um, any advice? Um, you know, it, the movie business has changed a lot. I, basically, I noticed it in the last 10 years and it's become, I don't know if I should even be saying this right now. You might have to edit this. It's become, it, it's not an art form like it used to be. It's more of creating a product um, and a room or a space to have the actors in, which it always was. So I think that now um, you have to be prepared to let things go. Um, more than like if you have if you want it to be a, a, a an art piece or the perfect set it's not that anymore it's it's you have to give the director and the actors the space to work in and you have to let everything else go i think and you have to be prepared to work hard but not be in love with an idea that you had in your mind that the set should look like and i don't know if that made sense it does. We've actually covered that with other people as well. It's it's yeah. it's a balance. It's a balance of where 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 you have to just let it go. It's like yeah. parent. when do you just send them off and let them find out for themselves? Yeah, I, I just it's yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I think it makes complete sense. I think I think the film industry changes all the time, um, and it's really? funny. You just find things. It's like oh wow. It's like I mean. I also find that quite exciting that you have to sort of adapt to to it, and it, and as Kathy said, it's frustrating, 
and you can't ho hold on too tight no. um, uh, and otherwise um, you probably <laughs> you'll probably <laughs> will leave the film industry <laughs> and, and I mean film's getting less and less I mean it's um, you know uh, I mean well I mean with COVID so many few films were made last year it's like but uh, I, I think ultimately I still for me I still love seeing the finished product on a cinema screen and and just because I want to sit in the cinema and be taken away from what's going on at that moment uh, completely without distraction. And uh, I mean, you have to make a good film for that to happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, you guys have made a great film. It's, it, it's, it's exciting to watch it from Very. cover to cover, even at 500 hours. I, I enjoyed every hour of it. You know, it's just should have it should be a mini series, but you know we can talk about that more. Um, we'll see you in the. It has a VR VAR yeah. <laughs> check, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thanks so much, guys. Thank you. I'd like to invite all of our panelists uh, to turn their cameras on and their mics on. And Thomas uh, Walsh, Thomas, you um, can lead the conversation with the audience. Thank you so much, everyone. Great. God, it was just like yesterday that we recorded all that. It's uh, it's great to be reminded of, of, of the combined power of your works. Um, and I must, just for our audience, uh, unfortunately, um, we don't have Nathan with us and we don't have uh, uh, Diana with us. They both uh, uh, are in transit or, uh, but anyway, you, we did have the best of them at this moment and they have their, their better halves to support them at this point in time. Um, I've got a, some questions, uh, a few related to your individual shows, and then I'm also going to give a little bit more of a share to some of the general questions, which is kind of like lightning round. Everyone can speak up, so don't be shy. Um, first one, though, is for the father, and um, I'm going to direct it to both Peter and Kathy, because it's interesting. Um, your project is so specific and tight and 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 follows uh, a moment in time so beautifully uh is a question about your color the color palette it, it the question was for um it seems the color blue to uh to fo follows olivia coleman's character everywhere she goes throughout the film but i'm going to expand on that a little bit and ask you guys both what was your approach to the color theory that tied the visual together because you're there's no uh, accidents of what you did. Everything is very carefully considered. Yeah, well, um, Anthony's, with Anthony's flat, I had to feel very different to the rest of the film. So that was ochres and greens. And then uh, once we get into Anne's flat, the blue kicks in. And the idea is that towards the end of the film, we end up in the care home, which has got a very cold blue. So uh, as soon as you arrive in Anne's flat, um, we used a very dusty blue, um, which was a slightly darker tone, so that we gradually get lighter and colder as the film went along. And it sounds strange to say that um, we, we used a dusty blue to feel slightly warm, because but that's what we wanted. We wanted Anne's flat to feel warmer than the rest of the, the film from then onwards, because when we get to the doctor's surgery and the care home, that had to be a very cold, um, sterile environment. So that cold blue, um, with the, which was aided with um, lighting actually as well, um, Ben lit it with a very cold light. So that was the, 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 um, the journey with, the, with the, the color. So we, we worked quite specifically on all, the, all, all of that. And also for the dressing to coordinate in with the blue as well. Um, and, 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 and of course, and costume as well. Um, jump backwards and forwards with the blue. So it was all, it was all very much a conscious decision, yeah. Does that answer your question? <laughs> it does. And, and then obviously, Kathy uh, and Jan, please uh, join in. Um, the, um, the Was there more manufacture than finding things on the shelf for you because of this tight palette? Um, as well, actually, we, we had quite a lot of the artwork manufactured to fit in with this palette. We had a great artist that has done um, some large scale four foot paintings that um, are really integral, actually, I felt to uh, to, this, to both sets. So we had those manufactured. We had about 80 pieces of art actually throughout the whole set. So uh, we didn't have a massive budget, 
So it was a combination of finding things at antique markets and getting them clear, the few things that we could afford to have made that were really important, like those large paintings. And then also utilising the good old art department assistants and uh, graphics to help out and to create um, pieces of art as well on the, you know, uh, lower end of the scale. But uh, yeah, so it was, it was a mix of lots of things really to, to try to keep in perspective to make that journey from the, you know, Anthony had a really lovely, rich, vibrant set for the Oakers and really wanted it to feel when he was in the care home at the end. You could see, you know, he lost, he lost the light that was around him, the joy, and he was there in this, you know, really grim place, and uh, it was really sad to see, and that was really done a lot through colour. So it was, uh, yeah, it was a good, it was, it was a good journey to do. Yeah. Uh, as a shout out, uh, this is a must. Uh, uh, this is a directive to all. Uh, designers, decorators wanting going into film. This is a must-see film just to follow, see what detail and discipline and a continuous idea executed perfectly can result in. It really is a, a great achievement. Um, now, um, going completely to another world, there's another question. This one question is for um, David and, and Elizabeth. Uh, and it has to do with the characterization. Uh, someone was really struck by your wagon, your covered wagon and its journey and all of its aspects. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more of how that evolved? Uh, well, in, in the book, it's it's very specific, it's very different. It was a, it was a wagon from a, like a, a springs that people would go visit and take waters from, but it had writing all over it. And we decided quite quickly, you know, in the book it's fine because he describes it and the rest of the book is just they get in the wagon. So you never are aware of that writing, but on a film, you were gonna see this stupid writing for the next two hours, which was gonna be rather annoying. So, and then Paul actually rewrote how he acquired the wagon. So it's in a, it, he gets it in a different way than he does in the book. So we really decided it was, it was a cross between a farm wagon and, and a town wagon. And we knew it really was always gonna be treated as kind of their third character for two thirds of the movie. So we had to, but we had to start it quite quickly because all of the wheels and the bases were being built by an Amish company on the East Coast and we were in Santa Fe and I didn't have the director. So I, and I had to do it like in two days and get find the stuff and send it. And so we really had no clue exactly what we were getting back when it arrived four weeks before the shoot. And so then we, um, but then we built a prototype on those wheels to figure out all of our problems. And then we had to build four, identical wagons that all got used different ways. Some of them had different wheels that went on. The nicest thing, we had a, an incredibly good um, uh, scenic crew led by Randy Ortego, who did a beautiful job of, uh, of aging the pieces. And we found a lot of original pieces on the wagons, but we filmed it in continuity. So actually the thing just did get dirtier and fall apart on the, as we went. They fall apart quite easily once you start driving along that road. And they really have no springs. They're quite uncomfortable to ride in. But that was a very fortunate thing. I mean, the top got dirtier and the, and the sides, you kept repairing it as you went along. So it was, it was very fortuitous the way it happened. So. <laughs> um, this is a question for the Mank team. Um, and um, it, the question is, were there any real Lo Los Angeles locations used? If so, how did you manage to make them look uh, appropriate for the period? Because we know how LA antiquity is about 20 years long there, and then we tear it down. So. Um, yeah, um, actually there are quite a few locations used, um, primarily the back lots um, <clears throat> at the studios. And, you know, it was just about being selective. You know, you can't walk in and just shoot anything you want. And, you know, we knew that we had to be judicious in our framing and our selection of where scenes took place. And we sort of cobbled it all together um, and a lot of the work was actually subtractive and covering things up, you know, um, especially on the back lots. I mean, I remember um, scouting it with the art department after David and I sort of walked, David Fincher and I walked it and, and sort of figured out how it was going to play. And then you start with your notebook, making your list with the art director of things that need to be covered or taken care of. And all of a sudden you have like 30 pages and, you know, you're like, oh my goodness. So yeah, but, you know, and on the streets, um, we shot 
you know, a couple exteriors on the streets at Ola Solskjaer and at the Glendale train station. And again, it's about framing. It's about being judicious. It's about um, being smart and not trying to, we weren't trying to overbite on what we had to show. Um, and then, you know, we used a bit of matte painting to help us out on it. And, you know, it was that we, we approached it very simply, you know, and the mandate was sort of, let's be simple and build complexity into the simplicity. And newsstands cover a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Which skins? Newsstands. And newsstands. Oh. In the Bring in the newsstand. <laughs> Picture cars. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and a digital eraser once in a while can't hurt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, this is for the Ma Rainey gang, and it's for all of you. The question is, uh, um, how did you make some of the limitations of shooting a film in a relatively confined interior space work to your advantage. This could probably also go to the father, father group, but it's, it's directed to you guys. Working in tight quarters, you know, it's- It was, you know, to be quite honest, it was a little um, intimidating in the beginning because I, I just felt like these spaces, you know, they needed to be done well in order to carry the film. But then, you know, it, then all of um, our attention was concentrated into areas and, and for the, for the architecture of the rooms, I think it was just, you know, trying to come up with textures and, and shapes and lines and really looking at, um, we, I looked at factory research and just came up with the most interesting elements that I thought fit organically for what this space would be. A factory being that the, that was, that was the space that we decided that the fact that the uh, studio would have been created inside of a, an older space. So it just really, um, you know, found a shape that was simple, but yet everywhere you looked, um, I wanted there to be interest and texture and and uh, just even the, the band room. I mean, the architecture of what was happening with those bricks in terms of where was there a, a, a crevice or what was the, you know, where was there the history mm -hmm. of, a, of a former shelf that had been yanked out or, a, or an old color of paint or just something so that there was always something going on. Mm -hmm. uh, but that of course always supported you know, wasn't going to hopefully distract from what the, the main uh, situation was going. And that was the drama and the, and the acting that was happening in front of it. But it was just putting all of the focus into the, the spaces that were, you know, honestly, most of the picture took place. Miss Lucas, question is, uh, uh, and it's, um, it's a praise to your combined abilities to um, have a controlled color palette throughout the timeline of your movie. What your relationship with the cinematographer? Did you have? I, I know obviously um, you all kind of speak in shorthand because you've worked together before. But how were ideas of tone and color uh, bandied about, or was there some sort of color board that you created just to help you guys give a sense of forward and backwards in time? Well, that was basically um, a discussion that. I think um, was between Nathan and and Chris um, uh, that you know that they they had that going back and forth and then um, with Hoyta he was always available but because we were in different countries he was with the shooting crew and I was with you know prepping a ahead of him. Um, it was hard to, it was basically just keeping the lighting consistent for him more than, than the color palette in the movie. Yeah, that makes sense. I, yeah. Um, yeah. Cause we, cause you have the red and the blue lighting yeah. sometimes. Yeah. 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 Cause otherwise you're just dealing with the moments as they are. It's not like, you know, you pick a yellow boat cause you want a yellow boat or, you know, everyone crew is wearing orange it's just those the, the realities of those moments in time. yeah and and then what what chris and nathan decided it should should be to t to help tell the story yeah. of the forward and back well i'm going to move some questions now into the general because um i think they're actually uh i'm hoping to get more interchange between you guys on these um the first one is uh what do you feel is the most important quality slash talent for a production designer or decorator to possess. Wow. <laughs> the ability to tap dance. 
Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> How long's a piece of string, right? <laughs> Flexibility. Uh -huh. Yeah, flexibility. Yeah, you can just say yeah. your favorite single word that represents the answer to that question. Yeah. I think humor. I think humor and flexibility. Yeah. 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 I like the humor and kindness, actually. Yeah. You, know? <laughs> you know, you get so, so much, you can be very talented, but if you're not kind in it, it's, you know, what does it matter? Yeah. I think adaptability as well, actually. You just gotta adapt yeah. to the situation and to uh, the story and to the director and, and it's a it's a it's it's just an organic communal thing, you know, where you just all work together to make it work. That's sort of how I try to think of it anyway. I think, I think one well, of the things good. as a as a designer that's interesting is it's it's our job to lead the whole crew. So you really do have, you've got that position of you've got to kind of make everybody want to do it. And if you're nice with them and you're adaptable and you explain yourself well, you really get a whole lot more work out of everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not yeah. to not to be using them, but I mean, I think everybody becomes excited about it. And I think that's, that is our, that is a big part of our job besides just designing. It's just, we've got to lead that crew. Yeah, so, I think it's really well put. And I think in relation to that, it's not using the people, but it's it's realizing, especially for myself, I'm the biggest fool in my department. And I think it's about getting the people in underneath me to bring out their talents so yeah. that yeah. they make me look good, actually. Right. Mm -hmm. I usually I, figure I, if somebody's not doing something right, it's because I didn't explain it correctly. Right, exactly. <laughs> so once you get exactly. that done. I think just having an open mind, inquisitiveness, malleability. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, 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 it's like if a, if a PA in the department has an idea or suddenly, you know, it's like, you, it's, I'm con I can hear what's happening and, you know, if we're in the kind of office and, I, and I'm always listening to the conversations and, you know, something suddenly sparks uh, a new idea, then, um, you know, run with it. Yeah, it's teamwork, isn't it? At the end of the day, that's, yeah. we're all there on the same page. We're all just um, working together, really. And, and that's how we, how we sort of look at it too. Yeah. Um, gonna, this is a continuation on designers and decorators. Uh, the question, I'm going to adapt it, uh, is many of history's beloved designers and decorators, especially in the golden age, uh, had sort of signature styles they would repeat through all of their work. And um, uh, the question is, is that a good thing or is it something to be desired or what? Anyone have a reaction to that? Do you, any of you have a singular sign, signature of your own that you repeat? I think you have to check your, your, your own style at the door and yeah. do what's necessary to support the story. Mm -hmm. right. And our personal taste may you know, enter into it some, in some way, but I think that we really need to serve the story first and foremost. And then, you know, I mean, I used to put little glass grapes into every set just because it's my thing, but uh, but it doesn't work everywhere. Uh, but I think I think that um, I didn't do it, Don. <laughs> I think everybody's got a, everybody's got a signature. <laughs> I was wondering why all those grapes were on the table. I had a moment there. <laughs> everybody's got a handwriting and you can't really completely hide that. So it's gonna be inherent in your work, but I do think it's like you still have to check it at the door. It's not about your signature. It's about what the story is, but you know, the way you write is the way you write. So it's, it's a little, that's gonna be there. And hopefully that's, your signature is why it got you where you were. <laughs> but, yeah. It might be but, easier yeah. for, it might be easier for others to see that in, in yeah. the body of work than, than yeah. It's like mm -hmm. when you design in a period and you have to be 10 years beyond the period to get out of the, you know, because we're just so used to the period that we live in or right. that, that element. Yeah. I think there's also a danger that you get typecast as well, actually, into a certain type of film that you get to do as well. So you don't want to keep repeating the same thing mm -hmm. over and over again, because mm -hmm. I think, you know, you, I was getting two apartments to do. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you sort of want to move on. You want to keep changing your, changing that you go for different scripts each time don't you? you try and go for something that's challenges you and um you know and hopefully each film is a is a completely different palette and a different story 
a different director with different um, with a different mood. Mm. Definitely, there's so many new things to learn with each new yeah, script absolutely. for people. So that's what makes it exciting. Also, yeah. every job's different, isn't it? That's the thing as well. Yeah. Speaking of which, you've given me a perfect segue into our next question. Um, what uh, for you all, <laughs> or for our audience more? What's the main big difference between a production designer and a set decorator? I've never gotten this question before. I'm I'm I'm, I'm intrigued. Well, oh, who wants to tackle that one? <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> Uh, don't be shy. <laughs> I think it depends on the. I think it depends on your approach to the job and where your interests as a designer lie. And um, I think the, you know, you as a designer, you're 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 in full on communication with the overall feel and look of the original idea with the director, aren't you? You're you're there to um, to to come up with the first initial. Uh, idea and vision and your set decorator works closely with you and tries to um, reflect that in the set dressing I mean it's it's a it's a it's a I think it's so I think it's such a such an important relationship that you're so close um, that you the, the designers there up front with the director finding out what the director wants, and then the designer passes that information on to the set decorator, and together you come up with a, a feel and a look for the director, I think. <laughs> but it's organic again, isn't it? Every, every yeah, job, I yeah, just it's... find it, those questions yeah. are quite tricky, aren't they? Yeah, I see a lot of nodding heads though. <laughs> yeah. I think for, for me, it's kind of, I think, being boots on the ground a little bit. I feel like the opportunities to, encounter uh, serendipity or things that you never talked about uh, or things that nobody expected to find, but suddenly you're in the midst of it and you just find something that you know works and you bring it back. And I'm not sure as a designer, you get as much of a chance to mingle in the, in the areas that maybe you do, but I feel like we're out there with people all the time and you know looking for things and it's just serendipity just comes up in a in a very good way a lot. Well, I think you want in that pair, you want both of us to have a different way of going at it. I mean, mm -hmm. we both got the same ultimate end, but I worked with a director one time and he was talking to me. He said, I don't know what it is with you designers. We're walking down the street, I'm looking where I'm walking, and you're looking at the sky. And I said, well, that's true. <laughs> we're both mm -hmm. going to be in the street. But you you would hate it if both of us were looking at everything the same way. So you really do want somebody looking at one way and the other way, and it all comes together. It yeah. makes the whole thing, I think. I love yeah. that collaboration. I, I, I can tend to be, and, and Jan and Karen can both attest it for the better or the worse. I'm, I love touching, I, I love being involved with that. and. Sometimes just being boots on the ground with the decorator, I'll see something like the conversation can happen in real time mm -hmm. and it can influence an entire set. Suddenly it's like, oh, there's a sofa, you know, that mm -hmm. would, and you can um, sort of fast track or, but I'll be sparked by an idea by, a, by something that I'll see in an antique mall mm -hmm. um, and just mm -hmm. run with it. And at the, that, that I wouldn't have thought of. I mean, it can either be brought, but it's, it, but it's that collaboration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a certain point in every film, at, at least in my experience, where you sort of play devil's advocate with each other a little bit. You know, you sort of, you know, they bring something and you question it or you're doing something and they question it. And, you know, that's important, you know, and um, I think it's I think it's extremely important to have that. Hopefully the two of you together, you push it down to the other end of the football field. That's the way you want it to work. Yeah. Um, I've got a question here uh, and it's, it's one I've asked before. And I really uh, think it's a good one. For, and this is from someone starting out in the industry and it's to all of you. Do you have any advice on how to maintain a work-life balance as a production, mm -hmm. does that set de production designer, set decorator? To avoid burnout. <laughs> Bad question. <laughs> I should bring my wife in for that one. I'm not really <laughs> Good liquor, I say. <laughs> I think time between projects is really important. 
to rest and regenerate and travel and uh, take care of yourself. It's hard to do it sometimes when you're on the job because you're just so absorbed in what you're doing and you're trying to get everything done in time, in, in plenty of time before you start filming. Um, it's something that's always a challenge for everybody, I think. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any favorite places you sneak off to? No. <laughs> Trying to get a workout and lunch would, would be oh, ideal yeah. or a swim before work. I was thinking Avalon or Catalina or something. Anyway, um, <laughs> this is a question from a production designer from Africa. Uh, trying to understand the, uh, the, the American system, I guess, somewhat better. Um, what is the hierarchy in filmmaking? Is it from the director to the production designer or the director to the cinematographer? Is there, is there a true hierarchy in this or is it just a matter how you collaborate? That's, I, I added that tag on that, wasn't it? Their, their question was about the hierarchy. I think you hope it's how you collaborate. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the nicest ones is when it's three. And again, you each have a different purpose to it, but you want to be at the same table with them, I think. It's bad when you, otherwise I think you feel a bit shut out. You know, if you're not, mm. you don't have that same um, kind of, of path of communication to them, I think. But, That's I, think we'll, sorry. I think we'll, we'll approach the, the project from different directions, but they're all the same direction. We all have our own priorities. I don't think there's a hierarchy because, um, of job description. I think it's, uh, again, I think it's back to that, that ultimate team effort, you know, where we're all coming from different, coming at the same problem from different directions or solution, I should say, not problem. We're all coming to the same solution from different directions. So we all bring something different to the, to the, to the answer in a way. And hopefully we all um, agree on that as well. And I think most times you do because it comes from a, it starts off with a small discussion about something and, and, and you talk about things endlessly and, and ultimately arrive at a destination which hopefully works for the film, I think. But I don't think there's a hierarchy as such. I mean, DOPs and directors obviously are on set together permanently all the time, whereas we're, we come and go. So there's different relationships, but I think it's, uh, I think we're all there together at the end of the day. That's the important thing. And I think with the father, actually one of the things with the father which works so brilliantly is that we have this team um, that we all have the same, um, definitely all on the same page, all the same goal, and we all worked extremely closely together because it was a very short prep time, and we all got on really well, and we all had the same um, aspirations to the film, and I think that was, for me, that was why the film worked as well as it did uh, from a personal experience, in that I really liked working with Florian and Ben Smithard, um, and, and we were real, I think, I think we worked as a really good team. So that's what I'll take away from this job actually more than anything, I think. And one would, can I, can I just say, it's like one would hope that it's not a competition between the designer and the DP as well, that, that you know, it really is everybody's on the same team. Um, and just through talk and communication and uh, you'll get, as you say, get down to, to the goal in the same way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A little more challenging right now during the a pandemic. Mm. But we're all working <laughs> in different bubbles, sort of. We can't, we can't, yeah, we can't all be in the same bubble together. So that I'm finding a little more challenging, but. I'm, I'm getting the, the note from high above that we're gonna have to get close to wrapping up the panel. But I, there is one last question that we got, which is both a surprise. It's something I've been thinking about a lot for a while. Uh, and um, I'm working in New Orleans in the deep South. So I think about it more every day, actually. But it's a question about um, uh, Hannah Belcher uh, made history in 2019 Oscars, becoming the first black person to win the award for best production design for Black Panther, as we all know. But the, the, really the question, the heart of this question is, do you see more opportunities opening up for people of color in production design and I'm tacking on decoration? And I'd love some, some, some response to that because it's an important question. Mm -hmm. Well, I can speak, the Academy has been doing quite a bit of outreach and trying to um, build our diversity as best we can. And it's always been, um, you know, Wynn Thomas and I, it's our passion 
that we want to make known throughout the country that our careers are available to people. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is one way, you know, if we can continue with educational outreach right. to get to places that wouldn't necessarily know about these careers and start students young. I, it's my belief that if we let people know and experience arts in high schools and, and that sort of thing that we can reach more people and bring more people of color in. But it's a, it's a daunting challenge and, and it needs to happen. There's also a, um, a program in Chicago that the union does. Uh, they have um, kids intern um, and PA on projects and the ultimate goal is to get into the union. So it allows um, people to, to be exposed to all the different crafts that make up you know, a film. And then it's not just, we'll see how good luck, hope you get another job. You actually have a, you know, probably a lessened uh, introduction to the union financially, but they, you are in the union. So then you're guaranteed more work. So then you begin your path which I think is something LA definitely needs to do. Mm -hmm. Because there are so many great stories here. We're a melting pot of so many different cultures here and there's a lot of untapped talent. Mm -hmm. I think, I think oh. to Jan's point, reaching people younger, just to, to, to yeah. educate and to let people know that this uh, industry exists and specifically yeah. this path through the art department and reaching people young. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Talent, isn't Summer, it? Summers, you know, in between school during your summers to work on films or TV shows or whatever it is. Yeah, so getting right. people in just as PAs, you know, yeah, exactly. as you were saying, so that they have a place to grow and they can see all the different different areas of work and what, what's demanded and so forth. Yeah. We, we have just to be educated about the fact that you can make a livelihood out of the arts. I don't know that certain people even understand that that's possible, certain, you know, even know that that's possible. Sometimes you feel lost in math or whatever, and it might be that you're a creative, you don't, you know, there's, there's, you can get a lot, you can make a life mm -hmm. um, from, from, you know, drawing and thinking and telling stories and one of my nephew's third grade teachers had me come talk to the class when they were in the third grade. I was like, I don't know what they're going to understand. But yeah, they asked really good questions. And they yeah. were like, she said, we did, they only think they can be nurses and, and football players or something. She said, they don't have any idea they can be anything else. So it was kind of fun to talk to kids that little and show them models. Great. I wish no, I had known about that when I was young. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Donald, did you have anything to say? Oh, no, your box. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to do a, a little shout out for the, the Art Directors Guild. Now we have our going into our eighth year, we have a program called the Production Design Initiative. And this is directed at anyone out there uh, of any color, from any planet, of any gender. It's, it's, it's as bad as blind as it can be. And it's really a, an immersive production assistant initiative where we, we mentor, we put people get them out there into the marketplace to be hired, to be mentored in, within the art department. This is for people who want to go into design and decoration or whatever. And it's their opportunity to explore it and figure out what their path should be. But it's an annual thing you apply online. We're open to applications right now. Go to adg.org and look up the PDI initiative. But it's one of our tools that we're using to try and bring clarity and a direct path into our industry because we sorely need more diversity within uh, mm -hmm. working the, the working slogs that we are, um, mm -hmm. um, you know, not just in front of the camera or not just certain areas. We need more diversity in our our art um, our art gang, our, mm -hmm. our art dogs. So please do uh, explore. There's so much information online. Go out there and find that information and 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 and, and be tenacious because anyone's welcome, especially in the art department. And the Academy Gold program is also a great internship. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's the same thing. Well, guys, uh, we're going to go to our conclusion. So uh, we'll ask you to turn off your boxes. But uh, thank you for sharing so much with us. It, it is such a treat. And we are, we are honored. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Our special thanks to our program's producer, Debbie Patton, the ADG staff, and the membership of the Art Directors Guild. And thanks to the Set Decorator Society of America and its leadership. Special thanks to the American Cinematheque Deputy Director Gwen Deglis, who you met at the beginning, and Program Producer John Hagelston. And thanks to our participating studios. I um, favor Netflix, of course, but uh, Netflix, Perfect World Pictures, Universal, Warner Brothers, and Trademark Films. And then uh, I'll take us out. Thanks to Weissman Markovitz Communication, and most importantly, Variety, uh, for their media support. Uh, one final thanks to our design teams and to all of you in the Zoom universe for joining us today. We are really blessed. Thank you so much. And then, um, some fantastic breaking news that we're going out on. Um, we are thrilled to report to you that the Lillian Michelson Cinema Research Library, something we've all depended upon for years for resources, uh, visual resources, the last of the remaining Hollywood Studio Research Libraries, has finally found a final digital home in perpetuity uh, at the Internet Archives. Please go to savethelibrary.org, that's savethelibrary.org, and donate any amount you can to help in our ongoing mission at digitizing Lillian's thousands of photographs and picture collect, uh, clippings. Um, the books are being done now by the archives, all which will be scanned and uploaded to the Internet Archives site. Uh, this is uh, in perpetuity and it's open source to all who are looking for an idea. Thank you everyone for this terrific conversation um, and thank you for spending your afternoon or evening with us. I'd like to wish uh, all the nominees good luck for tomorrow and I'd like to thank uh, Thomas Walsh and Jen Pascal for leading this conversation and the Art Directors Guild and SEC Director um, Society of America for their partnership uh, over the years. To the audience, thank you so much for zooming in. Check our website, americansymmetic.com for information about our up up upcoming programs and uh, how to support the Cinematheque. Thank you so much. Have a good evening.